Hello, I hope everybody is um, able to hear me. Um, welcome to this 100 Years of Women at the BBC workshop, which is co-sponsored by the Institute of for Spokes, let's try that again, <laughs> Institute for Social Responsibility and Critical Studies in Television. Okay, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce um, uh, the Director of Institute for Social Responsibility, Joe Crotty, who's going to formally welcome us and get started on the event. Oh, and I should say, I'm Hannah Andrews. I'm the organiser of the event. <laughs> Maybe should have started with that. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. And thank you very much, Hannah. And I must say, your post-lockdown hair looks fabulous. So, as Hannah has already said, uh, welcome, everyone, to this afternoon's workshop on 100 Years at the BBC. My name is Professor Joe Crotty, and as well as being Professor of Management at Edgehill University, I'm also Director of the Institute for Social Responsibility. ISR, as it's more affectionately known, looks to promote, support and engage in research and knowledge exchange that reflects the broadest conceptualisation of social responsibility across all academic disciplines. Thus, when Hannah approached us to sponsor this critical studies and television event, looking at the role of women in one of our national institutions, we enthusiastically said yes. The BBC is our national broadcaster. For a long time, it was our only rolling news service, announcing seismic events such as the abdication of Edward VIII and Hitler's invasion of Poland, which brought us into the war in 1939. Yet today, the BBC faces regular and sometimes contradictory critique. It's too left wing. It has no place in a multi-channel streaming world. Its appeal is not broad enough. As the national broadcaster, it shouldn't chase ratings, but should instead fill the gaps that commercial broadcasters can't or won't. It has also faced some embarrassing and shocking gender-based revelations. For example, Louise Minchin and Sarah Montague were getting up at 4am to sit next to men on sofas and in radio studios to do exactly the same job for half the money. Cases of gender discrimination and gender-based ageism have also prompted great female broadcasters such as Carol Walker to leave the BBC, whilst other high-profile male presenters, including Eddie Mayer and Chris Evans, were leaving the BBC so that their high and disproportionate salaries were not revealed to the public. And so it is against that backdrop that this afternoon we delve into the past and consider the contribution of women to the BBC, both on and off screen. Latterly, we will then complement this with a forum for sharing ideas and best practice around the methodology of interviews in uncovering women's film and television history. And so we will split our afternoon into two panels. The first will look at Women at the BBC, chaired by Vicky Ball with respondent Janet, Janet McCabe, and will compromise, comprise of the following speakers. The first is Kevin Geddes. Kevin is a PhD researcher at Edinburgh Napier University investigating the history and development of television cooking programmes between 1936 and 1976. While he is a specialist in the life and career of Fanny Craddock, today he will present his paper on common sense slimming, how the contribution of Joan Robbins' television, television's afternoon cook was reduced by the male dominated culture of the BBC in the 1950s. Emma Sandon is a senior lecturer in film and television at Birkbeck College London. Today, she will present a paper entitled A Backroom Person at the BBC Television Service on the working life of Elizabeth McGregor, a backroom person at the BBC in the 40s and 50s. Holly Price is a research fellow on the AHRC funded Jill Craigie Film Pioneer Project and works at the University of Sussex. Today, her paper is entitled Jill Craigie Filmmaker, Writer and Television Personality. Dr. Mary Irwin is a researcher at Queen Margaret University, Edinburgh. Her paper today looks at the contribution of pioneer Grace Wyndham Goldie and the creation of current affairs television. And Dr. Kate Murphy is a visiting fellow at Bournemouth University. She worked at the BBC for 24 years, primarily as a producer on Radio 4's Woman's Hour and completed her PhD at Goldsmiths in 2011 on the subject of early women at the BBC. Today, she will present the paper Before the War, women in the early television service. Our second panel will look at doing women's TV history via interviews with Chair Vanessa Jackson and respondent Elka Weissman. Our speakers will be Tom May, a postgraduate researcher at Northumbria University. 
His paper will look at constructing a history and analysis of play for today using an interview discourse methodology. Jane Barnwell is reader in the Moving Image at the University of Westminster. Jane is currently working on a monograph exploring the significance of design on screen, which is due for publication later this year. Her paper today is entitled Invisible Design, interviewing Moira Tate from the, a BBC production designer. Kristen Gorton is Professor of Film and Television at the Department of Theatre, Film, Television and Interactive Media at the University of York and alongside Mark Helby, Helsby, who worked in the entertainment department of the BBC for 25 years, will present a paper entitled It Was Bauhaus Without Realising We Were Bauhaus, BBC Women and Youth Programming in the North. And so with this rich and tantalising lineup, I will now hand over to Vicky Ball, who will chair our first panel. Thanks everyone and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Joe, if I may. Um, as Joe said, I'm Vicky. I'm a senior lecturer in cinema and television histories at De Montfort University in Leicester. Um, and it's my great pleasure to chair the first of the two sessions this afternoon on, as Joe said, the, the works in progress um, of papers which are going to all form part of a special dossier for C CST or Critical Studies in Television to celebrate the BBC Centenary next year. Um, as such, this workshop is very much about work in progress and a chance to share um, the, the existing research from our speakers and to provide feedback in a sort of non-Simon um, Cowell-like format, if that's okay. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts and any questions you may have in the chat facility, um, and there will be a chance to ask not for me to post those questions to speakers um, at the end of, um, of, the, of the papers. So just to kind of recap the format of, what we're, of how we're doing this first session, and we're going to hear from all five speakers in turn. Um, each of their papers will be 10 to 15 minutes in length. At the 13 minute mark of each paper, you will hear this noise from our little turtle here, as you reminded for, for good timekeeping. We'll come back and hear um, um, responses from Janet McCabe, and then before opening to the uh, rest of our questions that you may have. So um, yeah, Jo's made my job very easy here because she's introduced each speaker in turn. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Kate Murphy. And just a, a reminder of her title of her paper, Before the War, Women in the Early Television Service. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, so much Vicky. Um, I slightly changed the name of the of, the, of, the, of my kind of article I'm hoping to write. I've called In on the Ground Floor because I found a really, really nice quote, but it is, it's, I'm looking at women in the early TV service, and I extended the dates because I had a wonderful discovery this week, so it's now 1932 to 1939. Um, so my main research area is women in the pre-Second World War BBC, and to date this has predominantly been radio, of course, but I've always been very intrigued by the by early television. Uh, so, for example, back in November 2016, when the BBC celebrated 80 years since the launch of the first television, service. I wrote a blog about Mary Adams, the first woman TV producer, and I also spoke about on, on Woman's Hour. I was really pleased to get her name to the public domain. Um, now, my expertise is very much about the institutional BBC, and my proposed article will be kind of framed by this. Um, while there are obviously big differences between TV and radio, there are also a great many similarities, and you can see how early TV built on the practices that are already well established in radio, particularly in terms of the employment of women. And as my previous research has shown, the BBC was at this time a fairly pioneering organisation in terms of its treatment of women. Just to say, I'm hugely grateful to Sarah Arnold, who's allowed me to have a sneak preview of her new book, Gender and Early Television, which, due for, which is due for publication uh, next month. And I'm, you know, my article is very much going to complement her work. Of course, because of COVID, it's not been possible to do any new research, but I've relished the opportunity to go back and have look at my own research notes and the archi archival documents that I already have. So just as kind of just, the, 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 I'm going to look at do kind of five themes when I come to write my article, I'm hoping anyway. I'm going to be looking at women television producers, Mary Adams, of course, who is, you know, finally get, getting the public exposure she deserves, thanks to Sarah's book. Um, I've also literally just discovered that there was a woman called Jean Bartlett, who worked as an assistant producer for the BBC's early television service, which started in 1932. Um, I'll touch on her a little bit later. I'm also going to do a particular focus, focus on a programme called Picture Paid, which was the mainstay of the early TV schedules. And we see women making a very important contribution here in production terms, women like Joan Miller, Joan Gilbert, Eve Moore and Una Marson. 
Um, I'm going to be looking at the makeup and wardrobe department. Again, Sarah's thrown light on the uh, on Mary Allen publicly for the first time, which is fantastic. She was the head of the makeup department, um, a brand new department in the BBC, absolutely essential uh, for television, uh, as Sarah's has shown. Um, and uh, Mary Allen was, you know, frequently placed in the press as a technician. Um, but my focus is going to be more on the on the department as a whole and the way it fits within the broader narrative of women at the BBC. I'll be touching on Jasmine Bly and Elizabeth Cow, the two hostess uh, announcers. Again, they had much of the coverage in the contemporary press at the time. And Sarah's again written about their reception and their perception and how they fit in with the discourse uh, of women in the public eye, the idea of a television girl. What I'm going to be looking at is more of them as a continuum of the women radio announcer or not uh, at the BBC. In that case, actually, you know, it's interesting to see how they fit in with the kind of idea of announcers that had already gone before. And also, the other, other main thing I'm going to be doing is looking at women in support roles in the BBC, because this was the predominant way that women were employed by the BBC, particularly as shorthand typists and clerks, absolutely key to the functioning of Alexandra Palace, and very much an extension of the working practices of Broadcasting House and the wider BBC. Um, so in this kind of brief overview, I'm just going to sketch out a little bit more of a few of these topics, and then we can discuss uh, everything else more fully at the end of, uh, uh, in the discussion time if people want to. So just starting with women in support roles, um, one of the main findings of my previous, all my research is that how women were able to progress at the BBC. There's this fluid, fluidity that enables women to kind of rise through the ranks, which we see, particularly in the case for women in secretarial clerical roles. And secret people who are they, women who are designated secretaries and short-time typists are very, very frequently actually what we would call today personal assistants or production assistants. So they're doing much, very different roles than what they the title suggests. So just as an example of a secretary who moved to television. I have no images of her, I know very little about her, but a woman called Evelyn, Evelyn, Evelyn Peacock. Now, I've discovered, discovered that she used to be secretary to Eustace Robb. Now, Eustace Robb was the producer who was employed to work for the BBC's experimental TV service, which had begun in 1932. That was 1932 to 1935. They were running experimental broadcasts. And I found a couple of mentions of Evelyn Peacock being actively involved in productions, you know, particularly that she actually produced the final experimental program that was broadcast at the end of 1935. Eustace Robb was on holiday. So she's actually producing programs. She goes to Alexandra Palace. She becomes secretary to the television productions manager, Michael Donald Munro. I've got no information about her role there, frustratingly, but I am actually fairly certain that if the TV service had continued, because there hadn't been that seven year break, she would have moved into a production role. The reason I say this with confidence is when, in the 1947 staff, staff list, she's listed as a producer in radio in the European Productions Department. So she's obviously a woman of, of talent. She is a producer in radio. If TV had continued, surely she would have continued on to be a, a do that on television. Um, the, if you look at a picture page, um, we, we see, you know, women clerks and sectors are key to, to the production of picture page. You know, this is an absolute mainstay of the TV schedules. Uh, it, it's broadcast from the first day uh, that, that TV goes live, 2nd of November 1936. Picture page is there. It's on transmitted twice each weekday, afternoon and evening. By the time the service shuts at the, at, on the 1st of September 1939, it has broadcast 262 programmes. Um, but basically, it is a kind of a TV version of a radio programme called In, T In Town Tonight. Now, in Town Tonight, a hugely popular radio programme, conducts all sorts of interviews with film stars, musicians, sports personalities, record breakers, unusual characters. It's a real kind of mishmash of people interview programme. Um, and um, in the, in the, it, when it transfers to telly, it, has a, it uses an unusual device. Joan Miller, she becomes the face of picture page. She's this switchboard girl. She kind of people phone in and she puts them through to the studio to make it very visual. Um, so she's key, she's a key person. In fact, she said it was her idea, the switchboard idea. I don't know if that's true. So, um, and here she is with uh, Cecil Madden. Cecil Madden is the programme organiser for TV. He oversees uh, Picture Page. He is a huge, huge, huge enterprise. He has a lot of help from the women who are working in his team. There is a male producer. He doesn't seem to do very much. I, 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 my money, he's very dependent on, on others in the team, particularly his secretary, e, a woman called Eve Moore. Again, I know nothing about her. I've just got a tantalising memo that uh, Cecil Madden writes in 1937. He says that, that she's a she sits in pr programme building. She knows all my views and plans for programme balance, orchestral hours. She suggests ideas and artists to producers. She coordinates and fixes changes. She's doing all sorts of things on the programme. So obviously, even more is very important to picture to page. Um, Joan Gilbert, 
it, we know it's going to be a very important picture page to picture page. She's after the war, she's going to become editor of Picture Page. Now she joins Picture Page in 1938 as a clerk. Now she has worked on it in Town Tonight, in Town Tonight the radio programme since 1934 as a secretary. But again, it's a role that's much more like that of an assistant producer. You know, for example, when her boss is off sick for several months in 1935, she is producing the programme. She's working as a producer. So she grabs the opportunity to go to television. So she gets there, she's still designated a clerk, she's paid as a clerk, but she's known as a sub-editor. That's her title. Everyone calls her a sub-editor. I don't know quite what that means, except I know that her main job was to act as a scout. So this was a role that was developed for In Town Tonight. Uh, they got well-connected individuals. They were contracted to supply guests for the program. So they worked on, on In Town Tonight. They also did the sim similar role for Picture Page. And they needed 18 different guests a week. So these kind of external scouts were providing guests. What Joan Gilbert did was she acted on all the ideas that came through from the BBC. It saved the BBC loads of money, they were saying this. So she checked out the guests, she made the arrangements for them to be, she wrote the script, she's, you know, she's acting as a producer in this capacity. And in fact, I found some a document that, that there's a suggestion that she and Eve, Eve Moyer should be redesignated as junior assistants. They're obviously doing this job. It's decided not. I don't know why that doesn't happen. Um, I'd love to know more about her, her work on the pre-war programme, except, you know, we do know that she returns to the after the war as editor. So she is someone who has a continuum before and after war. Just want to briefly mention in Una Marzen, who is the first... Um, Black woman to be applauded by the BBC, she has a very important radio career during the war. Um, she certainly starts as a scout on Picture Page in 1939. But as I've been doing more digging around, I, I'm, um, and there are lots been written about the work that she did as a scout for Picture Page. There's a, there's a big discrepancy with dates that it can't be what, uh, it all seems to, the, all the, this information comes from, a, from a, a memoir that she, I think she wrote later in life. So there's, um, unfortunately, there's a kind of gray area about what, what she actually did. I'm sure she did stuff, but it, there's a, a bit of a kind of a date problem with, with this because she it linked to Radio Olympia and when Radio Olympia, Olympia happened. So again, something that needs to be explored a bit further. Just to kind of finish off, I want to talk about women as produce, women as producers. And yeah, this is this is Jean Bartlett. I've discovered in the past couple of days, Jean Bartlett. I found her when I've been going through um, some wonderful uh, journals called Television and Shortwave World, or Television, it's called in the early days, which are available online. Jean Bartlett is re she's referenced there as an assistant producer on te in television. Then I discovered that I actually had some information about her, which clearly says that she was worked in television as an, as an assistant from 1932. Um, and if you, when you read the uh, television shortwave world, they describe as producing programs when Eustace Robs on away. Um, and after she's resigned, you can see in, in, uh, she, she ends, her contract ends in, in, uh, in 1934. They write about how the feminine touch, which was invaluable to matters of costume and makeup will be missed. She's obviously the important producer on this program. Now, the reason why her career ends is that she's got married. She's got married to someone called Tony Bridgewater. He's one of the senior maintenance engineers working on the experimental service. Tony Bridgewater is going to go and have a really key role is at Alexandra Palace. So they get married um, and she leaves the BBC. Uh, again, there's all sorts of discussions whether she would have had to because of marriage bars and various things. But, you know, who knows what Jean Bartlett would have done if her career had progressed uh, and she'd gone over to Alexandra Palace. And she's obviously significant because, for example, in 1935, she's writing articles for uh, television, short shortwave world. So she, she's someone who's obviously key, an interesting person in the early TV service. And just going to just briefly talk about Mary Adams, um, who is so important. Um, now, she is the most senior producer, basically, in television. She goes in in January 1937. Incidentally, she just had a baby four months previously, which I find quite extraordinary. She goes to TV in January 1937. She, uh, she's, uh, she's earning the most. She's earning more than Cecil Madden. I mean, she's a highly paid woman, very experienced woman. And um, she's earning much more than any of the other producers working in television, the, the male uh, producers. Now, her responsibility is television talks. And this is the, an area of, of BBC Radio that she'd been previously worked in. So she's very, very experienced. Um, the BBC, the spoken word output on, on telly is very important. There's obviously lots of variety, lots of, lots of things with colour, drama and things, but the spoken word output is very important on television. That's what she's overseeing, um, the kind of serious content. And I've just got a little example. This is a, a week in, um, from Radio Times in, 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 in 
1939, just to kind of show the kind of scope of, of, of her production. So on the, on, the, on the Monday, she's producing a programme called Salute to America. She's got all sorts of people um, linked to America, films and all sorts of things happening. Um, there's a programme on Tuesday with Pearl Binder. She's a, a, a well-known artist and illustrator. Mary Adams does a lot of work with Pearl Binder. So we can see she's trying to kind of bring her these kind of radio talks, static radio talks to life with lots of examples. On the Wednesday, she's, there's, there's um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright talking, um, discussing his work with, with films and models. Again, these also presentations by Mary Adams. Um, it's such an unusual term. What does that mean? I don't presume she appeared on the screen. I just don't, I don't know. I don't think you know. Um, again, I, I, I'm interested to see what Kevin thinks about this. I, I, as far as I know, she produced the cookery, early cookery programmes as well on, on the BBC. I can see on Friday there's Marcel Gullenstein doing cookery. Whether she's still producing them in 39, I'm not sure. I just thought I'd pop in the following Monday when she's doing this rough island story. Again, a programme with all these kind of these grandees. We've got Harold Nicholson in there. We've got in, in the month, the previous Monday, she's got uh, J.D. Priestley. She, so she's working with all these really top people and bringing really kind of gravitas to the um, BBC television service. So that's just a kind of a little tiny glimpse at, at uh, Mary Adams. Um, I just wanted to kind of say, just to wrap up, you know, of course, Mary Adams is going to go on to be a very senior player in, in television after the war, continue to continue to with people kind of going forward and going forward in television. Um, but I just kind of, I suppose for me, to imagine what, what might have happened if the war hadn't taken place, if there hadn't been that, that gap, how might women have progressed? How might television have been different? Because there obviously were women doing lots of very important things in the early TV service who then get diverted because of the war. And so things are very different after the war. So that's where I'm going to leave it and hopefully we can pick up some of those topics in the discussion later. Thank you. Right. Thank you so uh, much, how Kate. Do do, how do I do stop screen share? <laughs> Uh, you stop. Oh, yeah. you, you got it. Okay. Thank you so thank much. You. So much in there already, and some great questions to um, to pose at the end there. Personally, I think it's just wonderful to see the pictures of the, those early pioneers because it's so rare that we get to see those. Thank you very much. There are, there are very few, sadly, but a, a few anyway. Thank you. It's great that we able to share with them in in the middle of lockdown when this it's really hard to get to the archives too. Thanks, Kate. Okay. And um, next up, um, Joe has already introduced Mary, but just a quick reminder, this is Dr. Uh, Mary Irwin, who's a research fellow at Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh, and who's currently writing two books uh, on Love Wars and um, uh, an edited collection with Jill Marshall, This Country, UK Comedy Cultures. And the title of Mary's paper is Grace Wyndham Goldie and the Creation of Current Affairs Television. Okay, I'll now start and tell you about um, Grace Wyndham Goldie, uh, one of the most significant and influential producers and managers at the early post-war BBC. And I'm going to give you an overview of who Grace was. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what her achievements were. And I'm going to end um, saying why I think that she should be a uh, more known, more celebrated, and what her career has to say about contemporary concerns at the BBC. Um, so Grace Wyndham Goldie was a Scot. She was born in 1900, to a very prosperous family background, highly educated, attended Cheltenham Ladies College, Bristol University, and finally went up to Somerville College in Oxford. Now, before she joined the BBC, she had um, a varied, interesting career. She was a teacher, head teacher, a lecturer, um, she produced criticism and, in fact, did some radio um, criticism. Um, but the key point of Wyndham Goldie's trajectory at the BBC starts in 1944, where she becomes uh, a Radio Talks producer. In 1948, she was made a producer in television talks and features. And what's very interesting is this links absolutely with what Kate was talking about. She comes under the auspices of department head Mary Adams, um, another of the handful of powerful and significant women at the very top of the BBC. Wyndham Goldie made programmes about a whole range of topics um, and she was interested in international affairs and politics particularly and these underpinned um, really the rest of her career and where she has really significant 
um, influence and legacy. Um, in 1954, she was appointed assistant head of talks. And then in 1962, she becomes head of talks and current affairs. Um, and I want to kind of back up at this moment and say that although she is nominally um, assistant head of talks, really um, in terms of this period under her boss, Leonard Mill, she really is the driving force. She's the powerhouse. Um, and it's her passion for news and current affairs that is the focus of her career. And she becomes, as I'm going to talk about in a little more detail, really one of the, if not the key figure in the development of early BBC post-war current affairs television. Um, so what's being discussed in the department at this point is politics, news, and how really best to cover these issues. And of course, the department had been developing and developed the first television coverage of party election broadcasts to the 1951 general election. Now, what people were really interested in in the department this time was how best to offer a forum for discussion. How do you explain, how do you offer comment on political events, on, on current affairs? Um, and what is of real um, pressing interest is what would television broadcasting of news um, at the BBC look like? How do you shape a news programme? Um, what is it that makes television news different? And Wyndham Goldie um, had worked previously with um, a head of news who really saw TV news as radio with pictures. So she was very exercised by how this should all work out. And as I say, she is absolutely central to these discussion processes. Um, I've picked out here a passage from her biography because it states, I think, very clearly what she believes um, current affairs as, as she is developing should look like. And she's got her very own particular vision. And for her in this newish medium, using the new affordances of technology, such as the outside broadcast camera, she was going to provide, she hoped, the truth by capturing, as it happened, live the unmediated image. Um, there are lots of very loaded and freighted terms there, terms like neutrality, veracity, unmediated, and there isn't the space in a presentation of this length to really go into them. But Wyndham Goldie was absolutely um, certain that this was what she would be able to provide or to do her very, very best to provide. Now, um, at this point, current affairs uh, was really beginning to grow and the controller of TV programmes, Cecil McGivern, wanted to make more programmes and also wanted to recruit more staff. And he looked to Grace Wyndham Goldie to make these really important decisions. Now, Wyndham Goldie chose who she considered to be the absolute best of the best. And for her, these were young men um, from Oxbridge. Um, she considered them to be full of the ideas and the capability of making the kind of TV um, that she saw that current affairs television for the modern age should be. And again, scrupulously honest and dynamic current affairs television are terms that come to mind. And the men she chose went on to have very illustrious careers at the BBC. There was the future Director General, Alistair Milne, um, Donald Baverstock, who would become a really highly respected BBC TV producer and executive, and Anthony J, who among a range of achievements, was later to become the co-creator of the political satire, Yes Minister. And this team went on to make landmark programmes, such as Tonight, which is a kind of um, evening magazine, I would say, whose line can be traced directly through Nationwide in the 70s um, to the one show today. And the satirical, um, very influential, that was the week that was, which satirised the politics of the period. And obviously, 1962, 63, there's lots going on in government that could be satirised. Um, and it's worth pointing out that Wyndham Goldie distanced herself a wee bit from that was the week that was because 
um, although she was very much about holding and talking truth to power, um, she really wasn't about satirising or mocking power. But both tonight and that was week that was ushered in a new, more questioning approach to tackling the events of the day. And this was about providing elucidation, talking to those who had power and hopefully explicating to those over whom this power uh, was being exercised what was going on. So in this respect, Wyndham Goldie was very much concerned about opening up politics and the powerful to those who were living under the situation and in the circumstances which uh, these people were responsible for. Um, what uh, Grace Wyndham Goldie was very, very concerned about was what current affairs television wasn't going to be um, and what it wasn't going to do was built upon the documentary traditions of the past, as for example, resident in the members of the BBC documentary at television department, people like Paul Rota. And once again, Wyndham Goldie holds very, very strong opinions um, about this. And for her, um, the kind of actuality um, non-fiction, which was produced by the uh, members, some of them of the documentary department, um, was neither modern or dynamic or neutral. For her, it was in a very particular tradition, that of the Grusonian left, um, hung about with sociological um, as well as politics and the mystique of the cinema. Um, and I would judge here that uh, Wyndham Goldie is using sociological really euphemistically for socialist um, and she was very concerned indeed that this kind of filmmaking would politicize um, current affairs and would very much endanger the neutrality uh, which she was very concerned with um, and this I think is a bit like a counterfactual what would things have been like if she hadn't judged that documentary documentary tradition were not appropriate for the way in which the BBC was going to shape current affairs. And I think that's something, again, if there were more time, it would be very fruitful um, to discuss. Um, I'd like then to um, conclude on Grace Wynne Goldie's professional achievements, which are outstanding, which speak for themselves. Um, this is a highly successful professional woman um, who created programme strands or was responsible for recruiting those who put them together, who had a philosophy um, around actuality television and has left a very important legacy in programmes that are still remembered today, programmes such as um, uh, Tonight, which begets a whole light entertainment, light evening genre, and also um, that was the week there was, which people are still talking about and which is still referenced. She is a central figure in the creation of the genre of BBC current affairs television. And the extricable from this that she is one of literally a handful of women you can enumerate on the fingers of one hand to become part of the BBC's senior management um, in the early post-war period. And had she been a man, it doesn't seem unlikely or impossible that she might have been Director General. Um, also, when researching Grace Wyndham Goldie, what comes up a great deal in material, both from interviews that I've conducted and biographical material, is that um, she was frequently rather unhelpful and quite unpleasant to young women working at the corporation. And her focus was absolutely on nurturing, promising young male recruits, the Goldie Boys, as they called them. Those that she saw were the talent, the future. Um, I think this is interesting. I think you could quite, you could say, so what? Um, were people going to be asking if Alistair Milne or Anthony Jay were nice to younger men who worked at the department? And I'm reminded of journalist Kate Moran, who has often, I think, in her journalism said, if it's not being asked of men and boys, it shouldn't be asked of women. Um, and also, you know, how tough would a woman have to be? What kind of self-belief would they need 
to have got to the very, very top of the tree um, in a situation where very few women got as far as she did. And my judgment is that if Wyndham Goldie were to be asked questions around this, I think she would say, you know, A, if you're not tough enough, this is not the right place for you. And I think also she would say that if you are good enough, you will get there. And in some respects, you know, one thinks of figures like Margaret Thatcher, who I feel would not be interested in questions about whether she should be holding a hand up the ladder to other women. At the same time, I think in our critical um, context where we currently are, it's easy to look at the past and make judgments. Um, but at the same time, I think it still pertains in terms of how many women are at the very top of an organisation like the BBC. And in terms of women having to fight very hard to get, for example, the same pay as men, as the introduction um, of this afternoon's event pointed out, um, you know, that uh, that's still a battle that's being waged. And um, I would say in conclusion, um, you know, are women very supportive of other women within the BBC? I think there are lots of questions that arise from Grace Wyndham Goldie's um, role as a woman at the BBC uh, that are very, very pertinent today. Um, and I think that her career is very worthy of reappraisal. I don't think her achievements, her legacy is talked about in the same way as um, men, male contemporaries. Um, and I think also that she, uh, her career and her achievements speak very much to where we are today. And I think that lots of the issues I've raised around Wyndham Goldie's professional life um, as distinct from the, uh, the programmes um, that she made remain very pertinent. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mary. Um, a really, again, a really rich paper, which I'm sure we'll discuss in more detail later. Um, the, the question of sources and autobiography and the use of autobiography um, to this nature of, of doing archival and historical research, I think is um, really fascinating too. Um, so thank you for that. And now we move swiftly on to uh, Emma Sandon, who's a senior lecturer in film and television at Birkbeck, and is also on the steering group of the Women's Film and TV History Network, and who's published previously around women at the BBC in, in engineering. Um, Emma also contributed to the lovely Pioneer Women section of the, the uh, History of the BBC website. Uh, hopefully everyone's had a chance to, to look at that. Uh, the title of Emma's paper today is A Backroom Person at the BBC Television Service. Thank you, Vicky. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to share the screen um, in order to show you PowerPoint to help me um, guide you through this, this um, presentation around Elizabeth McGregor, who worked as a grams operator for the BBC um, at Alexander Palace and then Lime Grove. And, um, and then I'm taking this opportunity because it's a short presentation to um, allow you to listen to a, a short section of the interview. So hopefully all my share screen will work. Okay, so um, Elizabeth McGregor um, named herself a backroom person at the BBC. I, I don't think it was just her name. I think it was uh, something probably people did call themselves. Um, I heard Kate Murphy, um, thanks very much to Kate and Mary for your, your, um, your contributions now, really great papers. Um, and I heard um, uh, Kate mentioning uh, the ground floor people. So no doubt there were these terms used by people themselves in terms of uh, designating where they were in the production units of the BBC. So my interview with Elizabeth McGregor was in 1995 when I was doing my PhD for uh, building up the Alexander Palace Television Society collection on early television at the BBC, um, where I'd inherited a lot of uh, tapes that the, um, the Alexander Palace Television Society had recorded, both joint tapes, some individual contributions. Uh, and I picked out people who hadn't really been uh, interviewed at all and went to see um, Elizabeth McGregor. And um, she was listed, but she hadn't been attending the reunions that took place in the 1990s um, around this centenary, 
it wasn't the centenary, the 60 years of um, Alexander Palace Television Society, television opening in 1936. Um, and I drew on her interview slightly for the article that Vicky's just mentioned about women working in engineering at the BBC. Um, and that was a, a collection of essays a number of us put in for the feminist media histories, which is uh, a great opportunity to look at the um, engineering uh, recruitment of the BBC from the uh, war period of World War II um, through into the 50s. And here um, I used a quote from her where she talked about getting into trouble when sound mixing in the studio as a technical assistant at the television service in the 40s when women weren't supposed to do it. Um, and she said, I don't think it was anything to do with pay. It was just a sort of sex thing. Women weren't supposed to do this job and if we let them into it, goodness knows how much competition we'll eventually have. And um, I enlarged on some of that uh, jointly writing um, with others on the pioneering women's section of the history of the BBC that um, Vicky's just mentioned. Um, it is a very great site. So thanks to Kate Murphy, Vicky and others who, who uh, got us all writing for that. Um, so there's a section there on women in engineering as well. So the biography um, of Elizabeth was that she was born in 1920 in Scotland and she went on to study a BA and MA in English and philosophy at St Andrews and um, she decided then that she wanted to not work in academia, <laughs> uh, she wanted to work in the, in, in the real world and make a contribution uh, in wartime and she answered an advert to go and work for what she named as the corporation, um, a big employer uh, at the time to work for radio in 1943 when there were specific adverts for women to be recruited as technical assistants during World War II when men had um, been called up for the war. So she remained there uh, for some time and then in 1946 when as Kate Murphy said the television service had closed down in 1939 after three years and then as an experimental service and then it reopened in 1946 um, and then technical assistants um, were um, open for women to be recruited to. So some of her colleagues, Gladys Davis, um, her name was Gladys Strickland at the time, um, she was working with went to work for television and then Elizabeth decided to also join television and she worked then first at Alexander Palace and then when the BBC moved its television service in the early 50s or from 49 onwards to Lime Grove, she went over to Lime Grove. She returned to work in radio sound in the 1960s and then she eventually retired from the BBC in 1970. So her jobs at the BBC were first technical assistant in radio and this was at Alden, Aldenham during the war and uh, the kind of work she was involved in was mixing and continuity for wartime broadcasting overseas so she wasn't doing grams operating at that point um, and the work consisted of three shifts either daytime evening or night and she found that extremely tiring and she left to work for television um, because she wanted to get away from the night shift work she was finding that Quite exhausting. But it also it was an opportunity in her job uh, changed. Um, as a backroom person she never really responded to any of the questions I asked about ambition, um, wanting to uh, change her career or shift in her career. She's very um, very modest about her um, ambitions um, so she always talked in terms of practicalities or something like health um, um, and things like uh, finances for her, her uh, the kind of money she was making or secure job in the BBC. So when she joined uh, the as a technical assistant in television she was involved in first multiple tasks with the other women um, who assisted in camera and sound on the studio floor then they'd be on to this uh, central switchboard and then they lace up the telly silly machine so they had a lot of different jobs and, and, and variants in their, in their work in the first year or two um, of, tele of the television service and all of them 
talked about enjoying that uh, because even if the telecine was difficult to use or the switchboard got boring, you were shifting around and, and learning lots of skills and multiple tasking. And then um, after a while within Alexander Palace still, it was growing at a very fast rate, um, very cramped spaces uh, in the studios there, but very ambitious uh, programming, live programming, of course, we're talking all the time in the 40s. Um, the te technical assistant jobs were then shifted in the late 40s um, and people who had been working as technical assistants, particularly women, were allocated to vision mixing or grams operation. So Elizabeth opted for grams operation after she had health issues with working on vision mixing. She said by the end of the 40s into the early 50s, uh, vision mixing was um, was shifting fast as a as a as an actual skill, uh, she was quite good at it, she uh, told me. Um, it was uh, shifting from kind of cutting and fading um, into very fast variety shows. Um, and in fact, uh, men who had decided not to come back into vision mixing after the war started to want to take up vision mixing again. There were quite a few men who um, didn't really uh, leave the studios um, uh, during the war, they're a bit older. and so. Some of the men actually wanted to um, pick up with vision mixing. So the job of vision mixing changed in terms of its status. And at some point in the fifth, early 50s, vision mixing actually becomes um, seen as more skilled by senior management and the um, growing union staff association um, lobby at the time. Um, and uh, women started not to do so much vision mixing. So in that shifting time, Elizabeth um, anyway had moved on to Op for Graham's operation. Um, and she worked both in the studio and at Alexander Palace and on outside broadcastings in the van that would go out uh, to broadcast not just news and talks programs, but often in its early days, it was doing um, uh, live, um, it was uh, experimenting in doing a live outside broadcasting of theatre, then ballet, uh, and various. Um, programs uh, that were very ambitious at the time and of course sport. She then moved to Lime Grove where she became actually a senior grams operator. She was working across a whole range of programming of drama, ballet, variety talks and she was um, very skilled by then and um, Rudolf Cartier, the well-known television drama producer, would ask for her and for her crew for his live productions because um, she was uh, very good at what she did. And she says that she got lots of appreciation of her work. Um, I'm just gonna go out of this one. I'm just uh, finishing that uh, to go to the other piece um, I wanted to show you. Excuse my desktop. I wasn't meant to show you that. Um, she said she got lots of appreciation um, for her work on Grams, uh, the artists themselves, but the producers, um, apart from Rudel Cartier, were very happy with her work. Um, and obviously she built a lot of skills up. And um, I'm not gonna try and talk about uh, the development of Grams operation, partly because I, I need to go into the archives, um, uh, but obviously there's a certain amount uh, written about it in the Pauli, a big book on engineering written in the 70s um, by Edward Pauli. So, um, I need to develop how the grams operating actually shifted. Um, but I thought just in terms for you to get a sense of the way she was working um, and the kind of skills she developed, um, I pay, play you this three minute clip. So this is on Panopto. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so please, um, Vicky, let me know if you can't hear the sound. It's like that. Because grams were a much, a much more complicated job when it came to marking up scripts. Okay, so what, 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 why was it more complicated, the grams? Oh, well, of course, you, you see, you, you were told on the script you know, what sound effect or music effect or, or group of effects and music were wanted at, at all different points right through the script. And you had to, or you had to uh, well, put a note of what record you had at that particular spot or what group of records. And the actual point on the vernier, in which you had to have the, the, the pickup arm to bring it in at the right, just the right spot. 
and um, it's a little bit difficult to remember. Um, you had to do, do this right through the script. Because you weren't just saying it wasn't just this camera and then another camera. It was perhaps this record followed by a sequence of four different records. And you also had to note what turntables they had to go on. Because there, were, there were four turntables there. Mm. So how would you mark the actual um, record? Well, this was a very primitive thing. Um, we had literally to mark it with a pencil. We had, there was nothing automatic. We had to you drop... Could you could see it on the... Yes. We had to listen to... In 78, was it? 78. They could take it, really. Yes, the, the, the grooves were coarser. So you had to mark it with a very fine china graph pencil. Poise the, the pickup over this point, and when the, the, the your goo came, drop it literally onto the record. Makes me nervous to think about it. That it's terrifying. <laughs> and latterly, of course, we had uh, we do we did have an automatic device for presetting, but there was another um, snag too in uh, the olden days that the, the, the turntable itself sometimes swung, so that when you dropped the the, the, the pickup onto the disc, it was in the ro the wrong place. This usually was the problem at the beginning of the disc. So there was a special technique that one or two of us evolved. It was from, from sound radio, we used it in sound radio. Well, it, you, you listened on headphones to the beginning of the, say, the first note of the music you were going to bring in. Then you, you moved it back a bit. Then you switched off. And then when it came to the point when you were able to put it on the transmission, you quickly switched it on again and spun the, the disc with your hand. And at the exact spot when the note came, quickly faded it in. That was absolutely terrifying to start with. Absolutely. A good and technique, though. Very. Yeah. And of course, you weren't just doing it one record at a time in a show. You could be mixing them in a whole crowd. Latterly, well, certainly in the later years, we could be working with as many as um, five turntables and two tape recorders, following the script and watching the monitor as well. How did you do it? I don't know. <laughs> just, just experience. But the rather annoying thing was people often dismissed the job. Oh, grand, anyone can stick records on. My goodness, it could be the worst job in the studio. Well, it sounds, you know, it's got a gramophone operator. It doesn't sound, have any ring to it at all, but as soon as you hear what the job involves. It's rather difficult. It's quite diff a difficult sound mixing job. Absolutely. It's done live. Yes, we're doing it. used to frighten one or two of the guys. Yes. Well, that's quite interesting. Um, because it's quite a difficult job to do that. Yes. Um, and you said you were doing it with a pencil. Yes. Um, and you were doing it with a pencil. Yes. And you were doing it with a pencil. Yes. And you were doing it with a pencil. Yes. And you were but it was, and I preferred it actually to vision mixing, because it did require some sort of artistic skill. You were sort of painting pictures with it. So um, yeah, just to um, to wind up, um, you can hear the kind of level of um, really like a kind of DJ mixing and and live sound um, improvising that was going on there. Um, so I think it's a, a really complex job and it's um, really interesting to know how she developed that. And I will hopefully in the um, development of this paper, bring out much more from the interview about how she uh, developed her skills and maybe um, compare those to other gram operators um, from that period of the 40s and 50s. Okay, I think I've finished there, thanks. Thanks a lot, Emma, and great to hear about um, uh, Elizabeth there and her nerves of steel. <laughs> and uh, to bring into view, again, those women in, in so-called below-the-line roles that are often overlooked, particularly in television history. Um, so we'll move on now to Holly Price, who is a research fellow um, on an AHE-funded project about Jill, uh, Jill Craigie, the film pioneer and who's also uh, the associate producer on Independent Miss Craigie, a new biographical documentary, which some, some folk might have seen at BAPS recently, I believe. Um, Holly, and I think it's gonna be shown at the Women's Film and TV History Network conference. Is that right? Yeah, so we look forward to that. Um, so I haven't seen it yet. Holly's monograph, Picturing Home, Domesticity, Life and Modernity in 1940s British Film was also published by Manchester Uni University Press earlier this year. So again, another one too. Um, to look up. And the title of Holly's paper today is Jill Craigie, Filmmaker, Writer and Television Personality. Thanks, Vicky. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to find my PowerPoint. All right. So as Vicky said, I'm the research fellow on Jill Craigie, Film Pioneer. It's a project which is exploring the life and career of British filmmaker Jill Craigie 
who was an ardent uh, feminist and socialist, and she began directing documentaries in the 1940s. Her first films were Out of Chaos, an early arts documentary exploring the work of official war artists, and also The Way We Live, which uses a fusion of drama and documentary to present the plan for rebuilding war-torn Plymouth. In 1947, Craigie formed an independent film company, Outlook Films, with her producer, William McQuitty. With Outlook, she directed her first and only feature film, Blue Scar, centering on a South Wales village during the nationalisation of the mining industry. And also To Be a Woman, which is a 1950 documentary, which is uh, calling for women's equal pay. In later life, Craigie remained in the public eye as the wife of Labour MP and leader of the opposition, Michael Foote. In her own right, she was an activist, campaigning for causes including women against Tory cuts and was dedicated to raising public awareness of the suffragette movement's work towards women's rights. She began writing a history of the fight for the vote called Daughters of Dissent in the 1970s, which was unfinished when she died in 1999 and is held in manuscript form together with her extensive collection of historical materials relating to the suffrage movement at the Women's Library at LSC. Jill had a long history with the BBC. Uh, working as a, as a contract artist, she wrote two radio plays and began appearing on radio and television programmes during her early filmmaking career. In 1967, she also made two BBC documentaries. Returning to issues of town planning and architecture in Who Are the Vandals and exploring the fashion for young men's long hair in Keep Your Hair On. Two Hours from London, the documentary she made about the outbreak of civil war in the former Yugoslavia when she was in her 80s was also screened on BBC Two in 1995. As Vicky said, uh, this paper draws on research I completed towards Independent Miss Craigie, a feature length biographical documentary directed by Lizzie Thin as part of the Jill Craigie Film Pioneer Project. And this paper specifically focuses on records of Craigie's work held at the BBC Written Archive Centre. Following David Hendy's use of biography and broadcasting history and taking up Alexander Badenoch and Kristin Skoog's suggested entanglement of media and feminist histories through a purposeful stepping outside the media frame and exploring women's biographies, I'm using the BBC's records together with a host of other archival evidence of Craigie's life and work in order to explore her involvement in television in the 1940s and 50s as it grew from an experimental Cinderella service to mass media. In the early years of the BBC's post-war television service, Craigie appeared on two of its new women's programmes, Designed for Women and Women's Viewpoint. As you can see here listed in the Radio Times, she appeared on Designed for Women discussing aspects of her work as a director, illustrated with excerpts from her recent film Blue Scar. She was very much positioned as a professional, albeit exceptional, woman filmmaker. And as Mary Irwin has suggested, these women's programmes, including Design for Women, were really balancing an interest in the world beyond the home with a more domestic focus. So Craigie's talk about her work took place alongside talks on health and beauty and cookery demonstrations and within a set complete with armchairs, a bookcase, carpets, and a fireplace simultaneously emphasising women's roles at home. Women's Viewpoint was billed as an unrehearsed discussion by women for women of problems of special interest to women. Erwin again um, argues for its progressive spotlight on the public woman, active in the public sphere as citizen and debating issues of particular interest to contemporary women. Craigie appeared on Women's Viewpoint to discuss issues including Is There a Women's Viewpoint, Education for Girls and Women's Magazines. While there's no record of what she said on air, the programme's production notes and her letters offer some indications of her feminist lines of argument. For instance, in her notes on the issue of education, she wrote, there should be, there should be no difference in the type of education given to boys and girls. 
we should all develop our intellectual capacities to their utmost. And to those critics who say they would rather have a wife who can produce a good omelette than translate Homer from the Greek, I would say they are talking nonsense. There is no conflict between Homer and omelettes. One need not be taught at the expense of the other. While Craigie had been asked to contribute to women's viewpoint as a woman of established reputation in her field, her appearances also embodied some of the complexities of post-war feminism. Her public image in this period was characterized by some of the contradictions of the new woman, a complex construction, as Christine Geraghty explores, that combined discourses of women's work with marriage, motherhood, fashion, consumption, and glamour. Craigie was promoted and often pictured as a female pioneer, emphasizing her filmmaking work and engagement with contemporary social issues. Simultaneously though, press and publicity drew attention to her domestic roles as homemaker and wife in some instances, and frequently emphasized her looks in line with popular modes of desirable femininity. As Geraghty points out, the 1950s new woman was the subject of fierce reaction and rejection by feminists in the 1960s. However, Craigie's work should also be seen as an important precursor to second wave feminism in other ways, particularly in her work on the suffragette movement. In 1943, Craigie had planned a feature film about the suffragettes, arguing that women of her generation didn't recognize the movement's gains and its struggle for the rights they enjoyed. On Design for Women in 1948, Craigie introduced fellow guest, the composer Elizabeth Lutyens, with whom she'd worked on a film with background on her life as a suffragette. In the following months, Craigie was contracted to write a documentary that would bring the women's movement to life on television screens. This project was supported by Mary Adams, who we've already heard about, herself labelled a female pioneer as the first woman television producer at the BBC, and who Kate Murphy has described as one of the bright, motivated women working there in the vanguard of Britain's post-suffrage generation. Craigie wrote a script for a dramatised documentary. It opens with footage of ex-suffragettes commemorating Emmeline Pankhurst's birthday at her statue in Westminster Gardens in 1949. And that's accompanied by the provocative question, what does the vote mean to women today? Craigie's scripts and letters demonstrate her sensitivity to adapting her previous skills in documentary filmmaking and feature films to live television production and the internet screen. On Mary Adams's advice, she redrafted her script to focus on the highly personal, emotional story of Charlotte Marsh, featuring interviews with the real life Marsh and action filled drama sequences, following key moments in her life from first joining the militant suffragettes, her first arrest and being force fed while on hunger strike in prison. Craigie's revised script plays, pays close attention to using the aesthetics of live drama including performance, movement and close-ups to recreate a sense of Marsh's first-hand subjective experiences, thereby conveying to viewers the historical struggle for the vote in a modern way and on uncomfortably intimate terms in a scene depicting Charlotte's force feeding. However, head of television programme Cecil McGibbon felt that Craigie's script needed rewriting with the collaboration of an experienced television writer. Responses to the script from BBC documentary writers indicated some problems with its structure and style, but were largely positive. In a long letter to McGiven, Duncan Ross described it as one of the few really promising documentary scripts I have read since coming to television, but stressed that he didn't want to work with another writer new to the medium, criticizing the BBC's lack of training for writers. Ross also emphasised the contemporary significance of Craigie's project in terms of its feminist potential in changing derogatory attitudes, particularly men's, towards the suffragettes. He adds that the Craigie script is one that I feel can only be properly handled by a woman. Most men can see its possibilities, sympathise with its characters, value the dramatic scenes when finished as an achievement, but they cannot feel enough to put anything great into its creation. Ross encourages McGiven to give it to a woman if Craigie really needs help, 
It is sad for all the things this script stands for if in a huge organisation like the BBC, we cannot get some woman to help Britain's only woman film director on a script that is already very good. And he continues, when I've worked on one or two shows alone, I will gladly help her all I can. However, this wasn't to be, unfortunately, and the project was shelved for over a year. When it was picked up again, Craigie pulled out due to uh, former suffragettes complaints about her radio play about the movement. The television script was rewritten by BBC writer Norman Swallow and broadcast in 1951. The first draft of Craigie's documentary concludes with a scene in which the central suffragette character appears in modern clothes and chats to a fellow modern 1950s woman about her rights. An internal memo suggested Cecil McGivern's interest in Craigie herself appearing as the modern woman, which Adams and Craigie both rejected as she wanted to direct. And this is indicative of the continued tension between employing her as an on-screen personality and her will to contribute creatively. In the early 1950s, Craigie's appearances on screen gradually took prominence in her BBC work. McGivern wrote congratulating her on a new role in light entertainment in 1951, writing, I gather from Ronnie Waldman that you and he are vigorously pursuing the entry of Jill Craigie into television programmes. In a period when the television service was in the process of building its own stars and personalities, Craigie had a growing profile as a journalist including as a guest TV critic for the Evening Standard, and she appeared on a number of different programmes throughout the 1950s as a judge on amateur film competition cine club, a storyteller on press panels, and she also appeared on ITV's launch programme in 1955. Craigie took an avid interest in the growth of light entertainment, and she appeared on the hugely popular What's My Line three times in 1952 including on this special Ladies' Night edition, alongside regulars Marganita Lasky and Elizabeth Allen. Evidencing a continuing emphasis on her appearance, a review in the Daily Herald described, for a time it looked like being a case of watch my lines, as four glamorous women took over the quiz show, noting Craigie as astonishingly pretty in a white gossamer shawl over a strapless evening gown but also commended her for sailing right in right away and making an all-time record by guessing the occupation of a farmer in a few seconds. Beyond these glimpses of her roles on screen, Craigie's correspondence with the BBC offers new traces of her voice, labour and indication, indications of her enthusiasm for creatively contributing to early post-war television behind the, behind the scenes. In 1949, she had written to Cecil McGiven stating that she was bursting with ideas for television. A few years later, she noted in a letter to Mary Adams that television seems to steal all the news from film these days. Such archival traces broaden the scope of film histories that have focused on her relationship with the film industry, offering new insight into the progression of her cross-media career, including evidence of her enduring interest in women's lives, reaching them through uh, new media and her ultimately unsuccessful attempt to create an experimental feminist documentary, as well as indicating the tensions between the development of her creative projects as a writer and filmmaker, her feminism and her public image. Uh, thanks very much for listening. For more information on the Jill Craigie project, please visit our website um, or one of our various social media platforms that you can see there. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Holly. I know there's lots of questions too um, that will like, follow later on. Um, I suppose one thing that's popping out for me listening to the papers so far is the relationship between women working across radio, television and film. And I'm sure there'll be other kind of mediums that they worked in too, and to, to flesh out those kind of intersecting histories, really. So perhaps that might be a theme we return to later in questions too. Um, so we shall we shall crack on now with our last paper from Kevin Geddes, who was just said earlier on, um, is currently a PhD student at Edinburgh Napier University, who's investigating the history and development of television cookery programmes and their early pioneers between 1936 and 1976, 
Um, Kevin's a specialist in the life and career of Fanny Craddock and he's published on, um, on that subject. And he's also got a forthcoming chapter in food and cooking in early European television. Over to you, Kevin. Thanks so much. I'm just going to quickly and hopefully share my screen so that you can see my uh, presentation. OK, so today's uh, presentation, I, I'm going to focus on the work of Joan Robbins uh, and uh, outline, uh, I guess, some of her contribution to television cooking programmes in Britain after the war, but also ponder what might have been, I guess, I guess just in line with some of the, the previous um, presentations uh, and some links to those presentations, uh, what Joan may have gone on to uh, achieve within the BBC if uh, opportunities had been different, um, shall we say. So, um, in today's presentation, I'll, I'll give a very brief overview of, of Joan's career um, and the, the history of her career and her history, particularly connected with television, is not very well documented. Um, and again, I guess in line with some of the presentations that we've heard already this afternoon, um, that she's part of that kind of hidden history tradition uh, of women who presented on screen in the BBC. Uh, but I believe that she was an innovator and an entrepreneur. And in my wider paper, I will explore um, the role of, of different genders in television cooking programmes, and particularly on, on women in the BBC. But for today's presentation, um, I'm going to focus in on a case study, a, a programme that she uh, developed and presented um, on BBC about slimming um, and how that was perceived perhaps within the BBC um, and perhaps um, also how, how it tainted her, her view, her own view of working at the BBC. Um, I will finish by looking at what Joan achieved after her work at the BBC uh, and as I say suggest perhaps um, what might have been if things had been slightly different. So Joan um, began her BBC career on radio and similar uh, to some of the presentations that have been mentioned before made a transition um, to television um, for uh, cooking programmes in 1946 uh, 47, when television began again at Alexandra Palace. Um, Joan cooked in Studio B uh, and became known, I guess, as the afternoon cook. Her, her programmes were on during the day and targeted very much uh, towards uh, the, the still small numbers of women who were watching at that time. Some of the programmes that have already been mentioned, designed for women, etc., these kind of magazine style programmes were where Joan would be featured. She cooked alongside um, Philip Harbin and Marguerite Patton, who perhaps are, are better known names today and, and names that people will uh, remember and associate with television cookery. Um, but actually the three of them uh, presented uh, together uh, and presented the same kind of styles of TV. Uh, although Joan was the afternoon cook, she did appear on, on TV in the evenings as well and had a, a very full role in developing um, the, the formats and, and genres of television cooking programmes um, after the war. Her own particular um, style was based on common sense cookery uh, and she was a bit no nonsense, I think, when it came to food. But hopefully as the the, the presentation develops, you, you'll see that she was also innovative in her approach to food too. So as I mentioned, um, Joan was a pioneer in terms of television cooking uh, and the programmes, apart from the ones that have already been mentioned, designed for women, etc. Uh, she featured on programmes that often had women and housewife in the title. So housewife in the kitchen, for the housewife, for women, about the home, those kinds of things. Um, and she did um, what I would call standard um, cookery uh, discussions and, and talks, um, very much recipe based, but she established for herself a, a, a specialism, if you like, really, where she looked at different aspects of 
um, food and its connections with health and uh, I guess what we'd call now well-being, uh, obviously not at the time called that. Um, some of our programmes uh, in a particular series were, were called things like cookery for diabetics, um, cookery for gastric disorders, which uh, doesn't probably sound very pleasant, but I'm sure it was very welcome. And uh, a, a cookery segment called Cookery for Corpulence, where she uh, encouraged people, uh, I guess, to, to cook uh, meals uh, and dishes that were slightly better for the waistline than, than others. Um, this led Joan to develop her, her own programme called An Experiment in Slimming, um, which I will go on to discuss uh, as, as my case study just after the next slide. As I say, as part of her innovation and entrepreneur illness uh, on television, uh, Joan was keen to make linkages uh, between food. Uh, so as I mentioned, in terms of health and wellbeing, but also in terms of what viewers could see at home um, and uh, what was going on behind the scenes. Just as an example here, um, uh, jo Joan was very uh, keen to develop new camera techniques uh, and uh, uh, an article here that she wrote in the 1950s explains how she worked with um, the gas industry to develop a, a special uh, oven which had a glass uh, back to it so that the cameras could pick up the, the action of a cake rising as it cooked in the oven. Uh, and if we watch television cooking programmes today, this is uh, an image that we, that we see often and, and we expect to see when Nigella pops her cake in the oven, we expect to see it rising. Um, Joan was very keen that pictures like this were, were seen at home so that um, housewives, mainly who were watching, could understand uh, at what they were expected to, to see at home. She worked very closely with um, industries such as the gas board who were providing um, equipment um, in the, the studios at Alexandra Palace. But she also worked um, with government to develop um, food related policy and academics to keep up to date with the, the latest um, developments in food and nutrition. Joan had previously worked at the Ministry of Food and was well connected um, with all of these um, industries. Just moving on to the particular case study that I wanted to talk about today, uh, a programme called An Experiment in Slimming, um, which was broadcast 70 years ago in, in 1951. It was a programme which Joan developed from her own experience of um, seeking and successfully losing weight to um, aid her, her feeling of vim and vigour um, in life and to feel a, a bit more energetic. For the programme, um, Joan sought medical and academic input. Um, so it wasn't just her own experience of um, cooking to lose weight, but it was a, 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 an exercise, if you like, in looking at the science and uh, uh, ideas behind food and how they could help. Uh, the actual programme was very health focused. Um, and introduced a couple of real life volunteers, real housewives um, in the 1950s who um, agreed to be part of an experiment to see if indeed Joan's techniques uh, would help them to lose weight. The programme um, was, as I say, very health focused and very scientific, uh, helping people to understand the role of food in the body and the types of foods that would aid um, a, a good lifestyle and good um, mental health. Again, these words weren't used at the time, but the, these are the um, areas that, that were discussed. Very fortunate um, to have a, a Tele de recording transcription of the programme, um, which again I think indicates Joan's um, innovative style. She, she asked for a, a, a transcript to be made of the live recording. So obviously the TV programmes don't exist, but we have a script, uh, a transcript of, of what was discussed. As I say, the programme contained much information about diet, exercise, and lifestyle. And 
um, essentially at the end of the programme, as, as was uh, the want of cookery programmes at the time, um, Joan asked viewers to write in for a copy of her diet and her advice on um, exercise, lifestyle and uh, recipes too. The um, show produced a great deal of interest in the press and a lot of um, stories were written at the time about um, slimming and, you know, at the, the, the craze of slimming, if you like. Um, and Joan went on to develop um, a, a book uh, which outlined her, her approach to common sense slimming. However, the, the programme, although very successful and uh, appreciated by uh, the, the, the many women who watched it, caused some controversy um, at the BBC. And I would propose that it was this controversy in part which tainted Joan's relationship with the BBC. Um, the controversy wasn't particularly around the programme. Um, and wasn't particularly around Joan's input, um, but it was around the, 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 the kind of expectations, I suppose, that the um, information led to. Um, as I mentioned, people were asked to write in uh, and receive written uh, materials outlining the recipes and, and advice. Um, and 50,000 women wrote to the BBC for a copy of this information. Unfortunately, at the time, the British Medical Association um, went to the press and, and said that they didn't support the programme. And they felt that the pursuit of the body beautiful was not something that they thought was suitable for uh, housewives in the 1950s. Um, Joan disagreed, obviously, with, with this advice. Um, as I mentioned, the programme isn't really about um, the body beautiful. It was about the body energetic. Um, and the body healthy. However, um, the BBC took um, the, the view that the BMA was correct and refused to send out the information to the 50,000 uh, women who wrote to Joan um, and uh, caused quite a furore at the time uh, for those women, but also, uh, as I mentioned, for, for, for Joan. Um, at the time, I think I just heard a squeak there, so I'll, I'll try and speed up a little bit. Um, at the time, this caused great dissolution uh, in Joan's mind around uh, the, the style of the BBC. And um, around about that time too, she was um, approached to see if she would uh, join the behind the scenes team at the BBC in management. And she decided to instead leave the BBC. She said it wasn't a place um, for women and um, it was a toss up between getting an ulcer um, and uh, if she stayed and doing something different. So what did she do? And she went on to uh, be a, a highly successful um, campaigner. Um, she was president of the National Council for Women. She campaigned for um, all sorts of uh, innovations uh, and uh, developments which supported women and children. Uh, she proposed self-service supermarkets in the 1950s. Um, she campaigned for clearer labelling of goods and clothes um, to, to make shopping easier for women. She campaigned um, against taxation of essential items for the home, which would benefit women. She worked in the gas industry uh, as a, an executive and she also campaigned for um, shared schooling in, in countries such as Northern Ireland. Um, so again, she, she encompassed lots of different approaches um, on women's lives and lifestyles. She made a career of linking issues for women uh, with industry, politics and practice for which she was awarded an OBE in 1972 for furthering the cause of women in industry. Unfortunately, uh, when Joan died in 1994, her obituary makes only a scant mention of her time at the BBC. And as I say, I, I would imagine uh, perhaps what would have happened if she had used um, her skills in industry, politics and innovation 
um, within the BBC itself. Thank you. Um, and so now I'd like to invite um, our esteemed colleague, uh, Janet McCabe, to join us and offer her response to the papers that she's heard. Janet, as I'm sure everyone knows, has published widely on gender and television. Um, she's a steering group member of the Women's Film and TV History Network, and she's also the managing editor of Critical Studies in Television. Janet, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicky. And uh, thank you so much um, to all our speakers who've offered us um, such a sort of fascinating afternoon um, you know, with sharing your research. Um, as Vicky said, I'm the managing um, editor of Critical Studies and Television, and next year we were going to we will be celebrating the BBC um, across the um, year, and Hannah will be editing um, that uh, that volume. Um, and so today is obviously you know a one first step on that road. Um, so in my response to what I've I've heard primarily what I'm, what I'm hearing is how by focusing on women, on women's contribution to television and by extension broadcasting and radio and tele and film, because there is a, a real crossover here. Um, also the issue around women's experiences and um, on how drawing on different um, uh, sources and methods and conceptions of television what I'm hearing is this work is really about changing the story, changing the story of, of kind of television shot through the prism of women's uh, contribution. And what strikes me is, is how these new perspectives expand our understanding of television history, um, but also asks us to rethink some deeply entrenched conceptions of television itself. You know, for example, I think what's come out for me this afternoon is how these papers have really thrown light on um, how women's contribution is really making us think about television as a social force. Um, you know, Holly was talking about this in relation to the image of a modern woman really before, you know, second wave feminism. And, you know, a part of the problem with Craigie is that she gets lost under that colossal reputation of um, um, her, her, her husband, Michael Foote. Um, you know, Kevin um, was talking re before the break around, um, you know, how Joan Robbins was contributing, you know, to the, um, you know, really re reimagined role of, of kind of the cookery show and redefining what, you know, women and, and the role of women in the home kind of looks like um, and, and feels like. We're seeing here also, um, you know, women's contributions as contributing to television as a creative form, as Mary has illustrated with um, um, Wyndham Golden in Current Affairs, with Kevin when she's talking about the magazine, um, sort of talk show programs around picture, um, uh, picture player, um, and, and also the, the kind of contribution that women are making um, to the actual legacy of television, uh, you know, uh, which I think we, we really do need to un unpack and unpick. And, you know, and here Emma was talking so eloquently about, the, you know, those issues around sort of technology and sound and the contribution that women are, are making um, and, and how that role was so significantly um, shifting, um, you know, quite quickly uh, during the early period. So what I I've heard is also about how we need to kind of recast these stories then told by traditional film histories I think with its focus on key writers and key programs and even though our contributors have taken um, this idea of, of the biography and key figures you know really they're recasting this story I think and in particular how this kind of research this looking the other way as it were can really challenge some assumptions of television historiographies um, more generally. So as a way to break that down, some of the things that I um, want to sort of pull out of what I've heard is firstly around acknowledging women's contribution opens up the possibility for thinking differently, not only about the sort of multiple and neglected departments of television, and we kept hearing it throughout the presentations, you know, the on the ground floor, you know, women in the back room, um, in which um, women are working in the industry um, and, and in many ways this builds on the work of um, Vicky's project along with Melanie Bell. Um, but it's also how as the essentially collaborative um, nature of um, television production 
um, often obscures contributions, um, you know, relegating jobs and or, or, or not quite understanding the nature of, 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 of roles, and particularly these sort of transitional moments and, and how that can consign or demote the contribution of women to the margins or even to a footnote of, of, of history. And that was one of the very strong uh, messages, I think, that came out of those presentations around this issue of you know multitasking in in the early days when those roles were not defined so i think there's a really important question here of how we start decoding these job titles and it's certainly something that kate touched on um mary touched on emma touched on as as well um and also how those roles and the titles of of roles um can again um obscure how these women were shaping those roles. Um, so when Emma was talking about the Grams Op, um, uh, 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 which um, and when we kind of start to unpick that, that there is um, you know, a huge kind of creative input um, that was being made. And also when Kate was talking about the clerk, um, and, and yet once again, it, it sort of obscures a, a kind of more I I important role. So um, this then leads me to think about how do we actually listen to these stories? How can we listen to these stories? You know, how the women um, that, you know, we're researching um, are also shaped by their historical time. You know, they belong to a specific period and a period in time um, with specific social expectations, mores and protocols. Um, and thus, what we find from the research presented here today is women are kind of pushing against that convention, but at the same time are very entangled within um, what their time would allow these women to imagine themselves to be, but also how they imagined their roles and their ambitions. And I was really struck by um, Mary, uh, Mary's presentation when you know she was talking about um, uh, Vivian Goldie and and the um, you know the choice of the Goldie boys you know the you know despite um, the fact that you know she is a pioneering woman herself you know she's not particularly helpful to other women so that then also I think um, maybe shaped the way that we think um, as thinkers now and not really sort of seeing the contribution or, or having a st or struggling with the contribution that women are, are making because they're not fitting the model of what we think progress and liberation should possibly um, look like. Um, and finally, I think what the presentations illuminate for me at least is the importance of our enterprise in how um, women's histories, um, you know, have a very strong investment in, in the careers of women, in um, biographies and those career trajectories and the struggles. And this then leads me to the question of the archive and um, the state of it and how it, it structures our thinking of what we can and we can't say, what's available and what's not, um, and how the archive, um, you know, how it, how it structures the way that we think and what we can do. So one thing that I know that I've learned from my own experience is that there was obviously the obvious with the series of primary sources and the personal documents at one's disposable but there's there's also the need to be mindful of those scraps of information and I think that's something that's come over very strongly this afternoon you know what do we make of those pieces of information those pieces of paper that just sit alone you know somehow in exile from everything else and I know from my own experience that this can be compounded by the you know nation-based character of broadcasting where a crucial piece of information may lie outside of the national perimeter, um, either in another um, national archive of broadcasting, but also an issue of where the outside meets the inside, where the archive can't quite appropriate or possibly um, accommodate the shifts that we, we are wanting to, to, to make. And I think that's certainly something that also happens when there's a slide between, you know, radio and television and, and, and film as well. So um, it's something that uh, maybe to think about is the status then of the casual, those almost throwaway kind of comments, the unexpected asides. I mean, I love the story uh, um, around Jim Robbins working with the gas boards to design um, an oven which can be used in filming, for example. Um, but also the, the kind of unexpected asides, if you like, um, you know, the information that we can't easily um, verify. Um, and of course, what it 
is it about the verification process itself um, that we that we have to draw on when we are corroborating our evidence and make these hard claims about history so i think there's real there's a real question here about the status of the information and the documents that we're working with and and, and then there's the material that we might first on first glance think leads us nowhere but also um become more significant over time that you know i was particularly struck by what kevin was saying at the end so you know when J joan robbins is sort of talking about health and you know we can now see it through the prism of you know how much health and well-being is so key to our current discourse which is ne not necessarily sort of understood in the same way and can possibly be overlooked um as a consequence and and then how do we then go back and almost rediscover what has been left behind so um to conclude then as, as this is really a response but it's really a question as well to everyone um and it's really to um think about um the uh, sources of our evidence of, of, of the availability and use of that material. And I'd just like to ask everyone in turn, um, if they could just comment a little bit more on what they found and used in their research um, to, to reflect on what you think even counts as evidence in, in television history, um, which in turn sort of shapes what we, what we know and um, how, how we think. You know, I mean, can we start by asking about what types of evidence we use, the status of it, and, and what we can learn differently as a consequence. And, you know, and I'm, I'm very struck um, in relation to say, Emma's paper and, and Kate's, um, you know, how do you make sense of the uncertainty and the insta instabilities of an industry in, trans in transition, in flux? And as a consequence, how that extends to documentation itself um, to help us make sense of what's happening to the women um, and how um, you, you know you can actually foreground that evidence um, and that work within the, the actual research um, yourselves. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll finish there and then, as I say just open this question up to discuss this uh, the status of evidence. Thank you Janet and um, would the other speakers like to join us now? and perhaps um, respond to that question first, really. I guess it's a question about how we do women's television history. Would anyone like to go first? Anyone have any initial thoughts about it? Can I just okay. start because I'm kind of the earliest, earliest one here. It's inter really interesting to think about where you where you get your evidence because um, it's really hard to find. I mean, I cannot believe I suddenly Joan, um, Jean Bartlett, I suddenly found her, literally, um, going through some old journals. And then when I when I went back to my files, because I took photographs of these, sal these salary files, which I found so helpful um, to track people's careers in those early years. I think they've only, they only kept them for the, um, in the, the pre-war. And then I suddenly found that she was there, you know, she was there and it says specifically that she worked in television. I just, I, I was completely amazed. So, um, how to, I know how on earth to find out more about her, for example, I don't know, you know, um, I mean, obviously her, she married Tony Bridgewater, who's a very, very famous television person, I know they have a son, so there may be some, some way we can go, and, there may be some family papers, I'd love to know what happened to her. So you, you, th there's these tiny snippets, as you say, that you try and kind of, kind of expand, and I think for me, one of the issues, and I think it, quite a lot of others, again, we see women, a lot of these women, in the press you know so it's a lot of press coverage that we get so they, the bbc is quite good at keeping press and i and i love the fact that in the early bbc they had a woman's press representative elise sprott who took up the post in 1932 and it's because of elise sprott in many ways that there is so much about women in the early bbc you know and she's actually you know we can we can see in how fast she's part of her job is taking people to alexandra palace to see the women who are working there so she's generating the stories in the press about women so they've got their own kind of person doing that then of course the, the press them itself kind of distorts we don't know do we how that so it is there is a, there is so much uncertainty of how you uh, you feel certain about your evidence i mean it's a constant constant battle you just have to kind of do your best i think um but it, you know it is I, I've, I find it fascinating going to the bbc archive but and then trying to kind of augment that with what you can find in, in other sources but there's very little very little oral history there's very few interviews with these early women unfortunately so it is quite tough at times 
Kate, can I just come in there? Because I think that's something that really fascinates me about your work is, is, is the sort of fluidity of, of the roles of women at this time. Um, the, you know, when you were sort of saying that they were a clerk, but really they were obviously much more than that. And it's something that maybe Emma wants to come in on as well. And I, I suppose it's, it's, it's just how you can hear that story. Um, because, um, you know, wh where are the traces, if you like, you know, that as, as you say, you know, it's, it's somebody else mentioning it. And, and then what happens to them when, you know, they sort of disappear, they get married. I mean, that was a really interesting um, comment that you made. And, and also those breaks, you know, that, that's, that, I mean, that, that's one of the big issues, isn't it? I think for women's, um, you know, film and television history, actually, about, you know, how women get lost in the archive, so, and, and, and which shows an, a, a precarity um, of, of their experience as well so you know maybe their role will change their name will change and we lose them um, and it was something that really came um, across very strongly for me from your presentation and I just wondered if you could say something about the, the kind of I suppose the lost traces in that sense it is incredibly difficult and I think when you do women's history you have to do much more you have to do much more because you have to you have to look in I'm sure everyone has the same you have to look in places that you it's not obvious you know, there are a few women's files, but you have to find all sorts of things. I'm sure if I go and look at the picture page files, hopefully that the, there might be more stuff there. And, you know, em, I, Evelyn Peacock, again, she's someone I've just discovered, who obviously um, was very significant and trying to think how I might find out more about her. Um, and, you know, you can find things like, there are things like, you might find them in a staff list. You, you find them kind of mentioned in very odd documents and you can kind of track them down. Um, but you do have to do a huge, much more, much, much more research. And also lots of those documents aren't there. So you do get stuck um, and you can't follow it on. So I think for, when it comes to women's history of, of women working it there, it, it, is a, it is a bigger job. But it's very, very, it's very exciting, though, when you find stuff, because, it, you know, you often find them in little kind of, you know, odd places. So it's inspiring, but tough. I'm sure the same, everyone else has find, found the same. They're trying to, try, where, you know, how do you verify how do you um, find find those answers? Um, and that you just have to put more legwork in, really, in many ways. Okay, thank you, Kate. Would anybody else like to come in here? If I pick on people, I yeah, catch like go, Mary. Yeah, um, I would like to say that I found um, Wyndham Goldie almost hiding in plain sight. Um, to start with, I was looking for documentary because that was the focus of my doctoral work documentary TV in the 60s and I had to go back to current affairs and going through production files Grace Wyndham Goldie's story emerged and in fact it was a really big and rich and full story but it's sort of back to front I didn't go out looking for Grace Wyndham Goldie she she found me if you like and I think that production files that just the foot soldier work if you're tracing something and as he keeps knowing, it's, it's incredible what's in this documentation. And people weren't looking for Grace Wyndham Goldie other than this woman who got to be in management. They weren't tracing really the kind of incredibly significant role she took in what it seen as a kind of a man's, if you like, field. It wasn't the arts, it wasn't costume design. It was hardcore current affairs. So she was waiting to be found. Because uh, I think one of the things I found so interesting about what you were saying, Mary, is, is also, you know, because you're absolutely right, you know, she is in plain sight, but she doesn't, she, she, she's, a, I, I mean, this, this is going to sound a bit odd, but she's a bit of a Lenny Riefenstahl figure in, in some ways, is that it's very difficult for, for feminists to reclaim her when oh. she's sort of doing things that you start thinking, well, it's not particularly sort of part of the sisterhood. And, you know, and it's really interesting what you were saying about documentary is that even how she's out of step with the, you know, again, the traditional narrative of what British documentary is, you know, she's saying, well, it should be something else. And, you know, by pushing back against people like Paul Rother and the Gris and uh, uh, tradition, um, the, the, the narratives get lost when you're not part of that official story. Absolutely. And I think you're absolutely right. When I, when I did the research, I was so kind of, you know, taken on with the politics and Whatever way you fall, she is a very political figure. She represents one side. But thinking about it now, one's respect for a woman to get to that level and to be calling the shots and saying, this is what news and current affairs are like. That is an amazing 
achievement. And I think it's making judgments around what she achieved, who she was and how tough it was mm -hmm. and how hard you would have to work and what confidence you would have to have to do that. So I think revisiting my work, I have a much richer understanding because I've assembled this this body and I think you're right I think in terms of feminism she sits alongside I saw in the comments Margaret Thatcher mm. you know these are not easy women but then bloody difficult women are important and and also the first and it says something about the first as well as doesn't it you know so yeah oh, absolutely and, and I think it's like well if I can do it I have that sense that well if you're good enough you'll find a way which is terrifying and fascinating mm. May I just jump in here because there's some um, interesting questions coming up. Oh, Emma, did you want to say something first? Then we might just go to some of the questions that in, in dialogue with this, this discussion here, if that's OK. I'll just go very quickly then just to say, um, you know, in, uh, because I know the questions are that masses of people here have got masses to say interesting things who've contributed to television histories here. But um, in terms of methodologies and, and ways in, I mean, in, we're all following trails, aren't you? And I've written elsewhere about oral histories and what they can open up, but they open up more with other types of evidence and other materials that, as Kate said, you just keep looking and you keep digging and you keep finding associations and you, you follow trails and some women got married and changed their names and some didn't. Some BBC said in the 30s, they were, you know, married women shouldn't remain in jobs, but others did, like Mary Allen, uh, remained uh, divorced, you know. So it was all very contradictory, some of the policies and rules that are sitting in the, in the archives. And you can start to find fault lines all over the place once you start uh, following them. And, um, and different methodologies will open up different things. So I wanted to just also add to what Mary was saying. Is, you know, for example, because my project is always... My project started out by the Alexander Palace Television Society and I've written about how that kind of self-promotion and self-recognition and need to value their own jobs is often done by people working in, in film and television industries, lots of industries. Um, but they also become quite self-selective. So Elizabeth was on the list, but she had never, didn't like the union. She was a backroom person. But on the other hand, Jill Craigie wasn't on that list. Um, she, her politically, she probably wouldn't have wanted to fit in uh, on that list with, uh, with the kind of types of people who, who were quite middle of the road, really, <laughs> in, in terms of their celebrating the BBC or, the, or at least their part in it. It's not that they didn't fight with the BBC, but they, their, their part and it wasn't coming from the left as such, particularly. And it was interesting to see the reference to Duncan Ross as well. Uh, you know, all those, all those papers have brought up things you think, oh yeah, I must look up there when Duncan Ross died, because he died early on <laughs> somewhere along there. And you know, why that, why that particular reference to Jill Craigie's script moved from one person who was supporting it to, to someone like Norman Swallow, who, who definitely was a very different political um, cup of tea to someone like uh, Duncan Ross. So I just wanted to say that we just follow fault lines and traces and, and you have to go to move with them, don't you? Emma, can I just come back? Because I mean, I think that was one of the really, really useful things about your, um, in your presentation. It's that, you know, within those traces, it's also about really listening, you know, to the to, to those traces, because, you know, how they were, that even Elizabeth was defining what she was doing was not quite what you would expect her to say. Um, and, and also how she was, her role was changing, you know, what, what skills she needed. You know, this, this is, she's also almost writing her own job spec, you know, be, before the job spec, you know, exists. Um, so that's it, quite difficult in, in its own, you know, right, because it, then it's not in the archive, there's not, it's not, there's not necessarily a sort of specific piece of paper. Um, and so, you, you know, what, especially when we, we were listening to her, you know, she's kind of working it all through, through this reminiscing process. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about it later on when we're talking about interviews, but I mean, I just want to, to get your thoughts on, you know, what it is to work with this material, which is really very fluid in a way. May I just jump in there? Yeah, you've got to, you've got to go look for other sources. Okay, so, yeah. yeah, and the, the other uh, really pertinent point, which Alka has um, have mentioned in questions there, is about you know the fact that we're looking at BBC history and research and women's history at the BBC, but as she says here, you know what about women who work for ITV predominantly and trying to find sources there too, which we know is a is a bigger, more general problem looking at um, British television history, and you know I think um, 
it'd be it'd be perhaps we need a, another bigger event to address those sorts of questions and workshop that one too. So I do hope this is the start of a dialogue about these issues rather than a, a kind of one-off event, really. Um, I don't just to kind of broaden this out a little bit, if I may, because we do have several questions and I'd like to try and address them because some of the questions we've had are, again are relating to sources and about the types of women that are being researched here as part of BBC history. So for one thing, we've just had there about, you know, are these company women? Are these, as we said, are slightly conservative women? Women who, like, perhaps uh, Goldie, for instance, uh, or, you know, who, who would tell a particular story, be fit within the structures of the BBC. Um, you know, in terms of class, are they all, are they all from kind of middle class backgrounds? Presumably they're all white. Does anybody have any uh, any sort of thoughts about that, Mary? I mean, I think the company, I see um, Hannah's um, pointed out, Wyndham Goldie is a company woman. She was tremendously proud of working for the BBC. And I think she really felt she was delivering on the, the education issue. And that brings with itself all kinds of notice ideas of perhaps patronising or um, am I sort of telling people how they should view the world? But I think absolutely she was thrilled by being in that position and felt she was doing work that was bigger than just making television. I think she was educating the nation. So on Wyndham Goldie's part, I would say she would speak, yes, I, I am, and pray to be so. And I think um, a, a really uh, pertinent uh, comment has just been made by um, Non Williams there in the, in the chat as well, who's researching uh, women, uh, female pioneers, sorry, in Wales uh, in the 60s. You know, so again, it, it, those questions about region um, as well as the sort of national histories here. And I guess now that the BBC have, um, have recently sort of made more of its catalogue available. And I wonder about, you know, how much that helps to, because obviously the problem we have with television is, as it's been said many times, is that on the one hand where it's really hard to find histories about women or, or, or to research those histories. But the other, other hand, we've got such a, you know, a huge vast history of television and trying to find the needles in the haystack really. So, you know, hopefully the, those resources, those new resources from the BBC will help too, along with genome, which has been in, incredibly useful. Um, let me just trawl back, please, through the questions so I don't forget some of the other ones that have, have, have come up here. And apologies if I do miss anyone that we've got about another 22 minutes of questions. So I will try and get through as many as we can. Yeah, so Vanessa's question, I think that was... Yeah, sorry. Um, Hannah had a question for Kate. Hannah Andrews had a question for Kate about, um, which I think is, a, again, another question that can be broadened out here about decoding job titles and how this might affect our understanding of archives. And I think, again, with um, Emma, this might be something for both of you. So, uh, Kate, would you like to lead on that one first? I think it's possibly an issue with, with um, uh, yeah, with Emma as well. I mean, certainly, um, uh, pro pro probably with Mary. I mean, the, the idea of what, what your job title says. Um, mm -hmm. It is really tricky because certainly, you know, se the secretary, uh, short, they were called shorthand typists. And then in 1937, they, they acknowledge that a shorthand typist can be called a secretary because it's so hierarchical at BBC, you know, and the grading system and the kind of salary and the wage, it's all so hierarchical and different, different ways of treating different people. Um, so I, that's really interesting about what, in, it says secretary, it says shorthand typist, but they're not. And, and they, they describe, um, um, Joan Gill, but as a sub as sub editor, you know, she's known as a sub editor. It's just extraordinary what that means. So I, th I think women really do suffer from having titles that aren't clear, and it's so evident in, um, it, it, in when Emma was talking um, about. Is it Mary? Sorry, I haven't got her, uh, McCart, Sorry, I haven't got your lovely woman's name to hand. But you know, th 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 this idea that she was obviously so creative, and yet a grams operator sounds so so ordinary and un unimportant. So I don't know what, what you do about that. Um, it's just trying to, I suppose, explain that they are doing, you know, all you can do is, is try and unpick it. You know, you might be a clerk, but you're doing something a very, very different job. And also the other thing at the BBC, in the early days, everyone's called an assistant. So this word assistant, which is, covers everything. So you weren't a producer, you were a talks assistant or you were a variety assistant. So assistant is another title that in the early BBC, as the BBC has been created and they don't know what these jobs are, they don't have a name. They all start as assistants and then gradually they become producers, gradually they become um, directors. So these, so the, the names change, you see as the BBC grows, the, the names change. Assistant is great because it's non-gendered. 
no, that's a great a great one. But otherwise, they do have this gendered sense, I think. And Emma, especially with, I was just thinking here, the title of technical assistant, which always bamboozled me because it covered such a range of roles. Yeah, I mean, we could also be talking about um, secretarial roles. You know, the PA, we all know, <laughs> probably run the world. Uh, and uh, you know, that kind of that kind of thing would happen with all the producers in the in, in television and probably still does, you know, that the assistant would be uh, would would be running the show, really, and handing over to the producer who often weren't even prepared uh, in the live scenario. So I don't want to say that they weren't doing a difficult job. <laughs> And there's a, there is a related question. I'm sorry, I can't find it fast enough on the chat facility to name the person who um, posed the question. But it was around the use of family um, archives and sources and how you how you go about kind of getting in touch with families, particularly, I guess, for the period that you're looking at in those pioneers where perhaps there's not so much kind of um, opportunity to interview the subjects themselves who work for the BBC. Does, it, does anyone want to come in there to, to think about that, Holly? Sorry. Was Holly, were you going to say something then? Then I'll come to you, Kevin, after that's for you. Yes, I can do. I think uh, so. In the in the documentary we've made about Craigie's career, we've obviously include included some family interviews with her nephew. She worked on uh, for two hours from London, um, but family sort of materials are more useful in her archives, her sort of personal archives. So that's where uh, our main focus has been, but sort of responding to the earlier question about the resources I've used as well, that uh, the interviews that she did later in her career don't mention her work for the BBC at all. So this is where the BBC's written archives, which is just a pocket of her work that I came across by accident. I've sort of gone off tangent from family archives there, but um, maybe Kevin. Kevin, would you like to come up? Yeah, sure. I mean, just to say, particularly with um, Joan Robbins, uh, being in touch with her her daughter, who um, I'm in Edinburgh and her daughter happens to live in Edinburgh. And, you know, just through some weird coincidental connection, uh, we, we met up with each other and we're, we're able to just talk about Joan a little bit. And it um, encouraged um, her daughter, Catherine, who I think is on the uh, Zoom call today, to explore in her attic and find materials that even she didn't know existed and that she was seeing for the first time. So um, they've been incredibly useful to me and I, I you know, can't thank Catherine enough to, to help unlock some of those um, other sources um, and, and you know validate those sources whether they're newspapers magazines or or trade articles um, and the photos uh, you know just for example that I showed today were, were some of those materials that were that were hidden really in a, in a box in an attic and uh, poor Catherine had to risk her life almost to, to, to find them in her attic and I hope that she'll find some more uh, uh, following this but I think that you know these family archives are difficult to to find and you know, I've done similar uh, work trying to find some family archives with Margaret Patton or, or Philip Harbin, and it breaks my heart because um, their uh, daughters and, and families tell me that when they died, they just threw all their papers out. You know, they just cleared the, the, the filing cabinets and uh, they distinctly remember, you know, trucks arriving and just taking everything out because that's what you did when someone died, you know, and you were clearing out their home. So they never knew the value or saw the value of those materials. And, you know, with hindsight, they, they tell me they, they wish they had. Uh, but, you know, it, so it's, it, it's hit and miss. I've been very fortunate with, uh, with, with Joan. I was very fortunate with my work on Fanny Craddock to, to be uh, uh, exposed to her personal archive too. But with others, um, there, there simply is nothing surviving so uh, it's uh, it's difficult. What's anybody else got any thoughts about that before we move on to some other questions? Okay I might just um, choose a, a few select a couple of questions related to each people's paper if that's okay and then I might leave some time for you guys if you if you've got any questions for each other or any thoughts or reflections you have or questions you want to pose about your own kind of work and where you're situated at the moment. Um, so why we just spoke to Kevin there, may, may we just pick up on that, Kevin, a, a, another question, this time actually 
um, from Kate actually um, about who produced Joan Robbins programmes and how did she work with the team, the studio, in Kate's comment there was that the studio images were very male. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, I saw the comment and I saw um, um, that, that Tom had provided some answers from the BBC genome as well. So um, what I would say is that I've not yet been able to, to get to the BBC archives to explore those details. That was my plan over this past year. So you can imagine that that plan's gone completely out the window. But um, I'm uh, back on their waiting list and, and hoping to get in there. So it, it, it's difficult, but it's my next area to explore. Um, the production notes from um, the Alexandra Par Palace archive are, are really um, detailed as well at their production as broadcast uh, notes uh, and I believe that they're about to be published in various volumes this year um, from from the early years to to to, to, to the late 30s um, so, so they've been really valuable um, on, on those images and um, again those images were uh, publicity images from the gas board. So it was the, the the executives from the gas board who turned up perhaps at the end of filming to record some of those images. So they're not um, BBC images and, and perhaps that's why they they reflect those uh, those uh, male presence in the images. But I, I, from, from other images similar that I've seen uh, from Alexandra Palace, it, it was you know, a very similar scene, I guess. So, um, you know, it would be really interesting to explore that behind the scenes uh, makeup too. Thanks, Kevin. And Kate, there's um, a comment here about picture page. So, uh, I think it's Diane Charlesworth. Uh, thanks, Diane said that apparently there's no product, pra practically no production files for picture page. Largely due to the sheer number of episodes made. I mean, this is this is the sort of ironies, isn't there, around television history? Ah, oh. uh, I don't know if you've come across that problem before, Kate. Yeah, well, no, often. I mean, there are just there are so many gaps. You can't even start to think. Some of the greatest people have nothing, you know, at all, and it's just heartbreaking for the. Uh, so when I saw that uh, that come through, I was thinking, oh no, I'd had this kind of. I might be able to find, you know, I mean, I hope Kevin has a lot of people. It's potluck, isn't it? Yeah. So, anyway, I'm very glad to know that. That's a cool, helpful thing to know. Thank you. And I know there was, I'm just sorry, scrolling back up to, uh, I know there were some questions here for Mary and from Holly as well. And, Sorry, just bear with me a second. Laura had kindly posted them all together, but because we've been chatting, they've moved further up. Uh, I will go for a question for Holly, if that's okay, then I can find the, the other ones that I've noted before. Um, Tom may had asked Holly, um, do you know how Jilly got hold of uh, a, a book copy of Sylvia Pankhurst's The Suffragette Movement that she read in, the, in 1940, uh, which was a relevant, um, revelatory moment for her? Was it hard to come by at that point? Oh, oh that's a good question. Um, yeah, this is something she talks about in her British Entertainment History Project interview that sort of an apocryphal feminist moment when she read um, Sylvia Pankhurst's book. I don't know how she came across it. She sort of makes light of it, like she just needed a big fat book because she was on air raid duty and needed something to read. But I yeah obviously I'm relying on her interview there so it would be interesting to know more about her sort of feminist awakening but mm. absolutely and I know there was another question but I for Holly sorry if anyone wants to repost any questions feel feel free to do so if I've lost some of them here um I guess while I'm still searching, one question I had actually in relating back to the, the themes of, um, of Janet's uh, response there was these sort of non-linear narrative histories that we come across, the kind of the, the sort of um, recasting of issues and the fact, Kate, that um, Mary, was it Mary, Ad uh, Mary Allen, sorry, who um, earned more than um, Cecil Madden at the time? That, that's Mary Adams. So Mary, Mary Adams, sorry. Uh, and that's and that's a historical thing due to the way where the, the BBC pay pay salaries. So she negotiated a very high salary when she started, and by the time she got to telly, she was earning a very high salary. 
And then the, the new young men who were brought in as producers, because they basically, there were only a few transfers, most of the male producers that came in in early telly, um, and didn't learn very much because they were they were young and new. So she really was a, a very senior person. There. Kind of intrigued, interesting twist, tw kind of twist in the BBC, I find, about that. Especially again, because it disturbs, you know, these narratives that we have about here at the BBC at the moment. I think it's really important, isn't it, to try and capture that level of um, complexity, especially prior to the uh, mid-50s when TV became a sort of mass medium and what was happening in those early years, um, which might kind of disturb our narratives. So, sorry, they, uh, uh, I will go to another question from Daniel Viva Holly again. Um, Daniel says, my vague memory from the, from the time is that two hours from London had a significant impact on the debate in British public opinion about Western intervention in the former Yugoslavia. Have you found evidence on how far this was the case? Right. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Was it Daniel? Sorry, I can't see the comment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it absolutely did have a big impact on how people were feeling about um, that sort of lack of Western intervention in sort of violence in um, Serbia. I think I've got that right. Um, and so there was a lot of press around Michael Foote's um, he wrote a big article in the Observer about the guilty men of Bosnia, which sort of echoed his um, critique of appeasement um, of the sort of guilty men uh, before the Second World War. Um, so yeah, I think it would be good to sort of have more of an idea of sort of a reception study study of that um, documentary actually, which we've sort of explored a little bit in the film about the sort of immediate reactions and sort of um, like Michael Foote and Jill Craigie both took part in a few programs at that time, sort of debate programs on BBC Two, I think. Um, but it would be good to sort of look into that a bit further, actually, see what sort of impact they had. Um, I hope that's answered your question. Thanks, Holly. Um, thank you for reporting the questions. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, a question from Hannah for Emma, please. Um, interesting that uh, Elizabeth McGregor um, acknowledges that towards the end of the uh, towards the end the, cre the end of the creativity of the role. Did she say more about that, Emma? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, she didn't at that point, but um, throughout the interview, I keep ask, I kept asking her, you know, how she was working. So. Earlier to that uh, sequence, she talks about vision mixing and how you could get quite creative with the mixing of it, um, you know, fading and whatever else. And then she um, she kind of in the end decides that vision mixing, apart from her health, <laughs> giving her headaches or whatever, giving her nervous breakdowns, she talked about a lot as other people did, did what you call them in those days. Um, did she would talk about the kind of creativity you could get out of it. So. I think actually with all of the people I interviewed, um, there was this sense of people being happy to be acknowledged. So Elizabeth was very happy I turned up, interested in what she'd done and wanted to record her and went back another time um, and, you know, asked her about how she'd pioneered this or that. She hadn't really placed herself in that narrative. And then, of course, I encouraged her to do so. But that's what the whole society was doing. And the whole society were doing that because they didn't sit, think the BBC were acknowledging enough what their creative input was uh, or their technical expertise. And so it went on. I mean, Tony Bridgewater, Kate's mentioned, was very much part of that early uh, APC, uh, APTS recordings. Um, and he he's put a lot in there that um, wasn't really um, recorded before in, his, in, the, in the tapes that he did jointly with and also um, individually. So people wanted recognition and, um, you know, that would depend whether you were a great engineer or creative. But uh, I think, you know, my interest was how television was different to radio. <laughs> um, I tried to do the opposite of what Kate's doing, because of course there were a lot of radio things, but as everybody was saying, it was just sound with pictures. I was trying to see, you know, like Jason Jacobs and others who've written on the area, that it wasn't sound with pictures and it was something different and new, although it was bringing in those aesthetics. So I suppose my pitch was also about art and aesthetics. Thank you. And we've got two more questions. Um, one for Mary from Elka. Um, and Elka asks, do we know how Greece and Natal were more widely perceived in the post-war period? Is uh, Wyndham Goldie unusual or is she following established patterns of evaluation in rejecting the established documentary tradition? 
That's a terrific question, Elka, and I've been thinking about that in the other part of my mind as I've been listening. What I can say is for the Goldie Boys, um, the documentary tradition was old fashioned. It was slow. It was about taking hours and hours to do stuff. And I think people like um, Alistair Mill saw themselves as part of the modern generation using the affordances of technology. I don't know if this comes from um, Wyndham Goldie or if it's a kind of reverse mentoring, she picks that up from them. But it is a, a terrific question, Elka, and it's one I will be ruminating on a lot. And it makes me want to really revisit work I've done and enrich and, and explore areas that I hadn't. But I think the word is modernity. And where it's coming from is that these guys are old hat. It's a brave new world, a new Elizabethan age. Oh, sorry. If I may just ask Kevin one, um, if we can keep this a wee bit short, if that's okay, Kevin, just so that I allow you time to, to have a little dialogue amongst yourselves as well. Um, I had a question about the reception of Joan uh, Robbins's swimming programmes and how, the, how you know, again, bringing in the audience, I guess, about how the, those programmes were received. You, I know you mentioned that the, she got letters and stuff, people wanting the diet sheets. Yeah, so I mean, again, I, I guess at this early stage, my my uh, ideas about the reception are, are just from picking up clues such as that. So 50,000 people wrote for, for the, the advice, which at the time was a phenomenal amount of people that, that wrote in and sent stamped addressed envelopes to, to the BBC in the hope that they would get this information. Um, so, you know, that, that figure itself is huge. Um, in terms of other um, clues to the reception, you, you know, there's reviews of, of the programmes and, and write-ups. Uh, very fortunate that, uh, you know, Joan was well connected, so a lot of people wrote about her. But also, because she wasn't really on TV that long, you know, the, the time period was six or seven years. Uh, once she disappeared from TV, she seems to have disappeared from people's memories. So people remember Margaret Patton because she kept going and going and going. Um, and, you know, so, some of those uh, memories, I guess, that people have of, they, they say anyway, that they remember watching Margaret Patton, they don't have of, of Joan Robin. So it's, it's harder to, to explore. Um, I guess I know from the material that I found previously in the BBC written archives that some of that information will be there as well and you know again I, I do intend to, to, to research it more thoroughly but at this stage it's, it's clues from newspapers and, and magazines mainly um, at this stage. Of course because of the archives being closed I should, should remember this, I should know this <laughs> from my own research. Thank you very much Kevin. Emma would you like to come in there? I wanted to say something because uh, Kevin used, used the word about, you know, uh, well connected is, you know, we've talked about biographies and ways in which types of methodologies. But um, one thing I found, particularly with uh, another area of my research in colonial film, is that networks are incredibly important and you constantly find people through marriage networks, jobs. <laughs> they know each other. The, the, the kind of societies are. Are, are, are interlinked or crossing over. Um, so, you know, it's interesting uh, with Elke's question about documentary and the documentary tradition, that there was a hell of a lot going on with those fights between television and documentary on TV. And, you know, and Paul Rother going and being very angry about um, the established documentary tradition, but there was a whole level whereby traditional documentary did get established. In, in television as well, even if Paul Rother left and couldn't cope and so on, you know, around politics as well and anything else. So networks, uh, I think, is something that we need to kind of be thinking about. Um, and uh, all those wives and <laughs> changed names uh, are, are traces that we need to follow on that. Thank you, Emma. And we've actually, we've hit the nail on the head there at quarter to four, believe it or not, it's gone very fast. I'm sorry, I haven't given you any opportunity to have a dialogue amongst yourselves about your, you know, how your papers talked to one another directly. But I do hope that the discussion and the questions have, have offered up some of that in itself. Um, so thank you very much for your uh, participation, your contributions, your really rich contributions, both the speakers and, and respondent, Janet. And thank you everyone for your questions and comments and thoughts. So welcome back everybody. I make it four o'clock. So hopefully you're back from your comfort breaks and your cups of tea and ready for this next section um, of our afternoon workshop. 
So we heard a lot for in the first section about methods of, of um, archival research and that, that sense of bricolage and, and having to find um, the evidence for, for the women that we've been talking about in all sorts of different places. So in this second section, um, we wanted to focus on interviews as a research method. And it's a method that many um, academic researchers have advocated as being particularly useful in accessing histories of women working in television because those experiences are so often neglected from official documentation. Um, so I'd better just mention who I am. So um, I'm an, uh, uh, my name is Vanessa Jackson and I'm an associate professor at Birmingham City University. Um, I've carried out quite a lot of oral history type interviews in my own research and I was uh, I worked at the BBC as a um, series producer. I was there for 20 years before I became an academic so I can I can see both sides of it as well. So in this afternoon chat we have um, three papers so um, from Tom May, from Jane Barnwell and from Kristen Gorton and Mark Helsby. And then we've got a response from Elka Weissman and then questions. Um, I would like to ask Tom May to, to go first with his talk to us today. So Tom is a PhD candidate at Northumbria University and he's researching a history and analysis of the anthology strand play for today. Um, his own educational background is in English literature and film studies and he's uh, an experienced uh, A-level and, and further education or teacher um, before moving into academ academia and he's also an active blogger. Um, so his uh, paper is called Interviewing Women About Their Experiences of Working on Play for Today, BBC One, 1970 to 1984. So over to you, Tom. Thank you. Right, hopefully, yes, share sound. So I'm going to talk um, about women's experiences of working on play for today. Now, uh, my project um, is a three year funded project in Northumbria um, looking at play for today. Now, this came from the Wednesday play started in 1964, uh, which changed names. It was just sort of rebranded play for today in 1970. Now, this was um, known for its politically contentious, controversial dramas. I mean, not all of them are, but quite a few are out of the 300 plays for today and about 170 Wednesday plays. Um, there are around 20 a year, roughly. And these are largely original one-off dramas that went out uh, just after the news, BBC One. So um, my methodology for this, well, when COVID sort of struck, as it were, I felt I would take the project more towards um, interviews and oral history. So there was letter writing and also some emails um, and both had some success. Uh, I've used sort of IMDB Pro and agency websites to contact people. Um, and so far I've written to 129 people, uh, 14 sort of written responses, mainly email, but a few lovely handwritten letters. Uh, 127 people um, interviewed another five sort of arranged. And I must thank Vicky Ball particularly for suggesting I contact uh, Prospero, uh, which is the BBC um, sort of magazine for retired staff. Um, and a, a sort of 10 or so have came forward from, from that route. Six who I've interviewed so far. Um, now, um, to do the breakdown of gender of interviewees, um, I must admit, in looking at the figures, you know, I, I am part of this bias um, in terms of there being a gender imbalance in the numbers. Um, as you can see, you know, it's, it's 70, 30 for the number I've written to. Um, and Prospero is sort of exactly the same, but this really does reflect the reality of the numbers. Um, in terms of actors, the play for today history um, in the first series, 1970, 71, 69% um, were men, 31% were women in terms of all credited roles. In terms of the top three build roles in the Radio Times listing, there's slightly more uh, women but at, at a third. I'm including Gemma Jones um, at the top right, who is in the Ingmar Bergman play, The Lie, 
and also Simon Gray's uh, The Man in the Sidecar. Um, she was in two in that one series um, and very prominently featured in the promotion. I did write to Gemma Jones, but she, she gave me a very nice reply saying she didn't have time to, to do an interview. Uh, but that was that was that was good. Uh, right. In terms of specific women interviewed, um, and I've sort of been able to uh, place them in three categories. So sort of behind the camera elites, so writers, producers, script editors, um, actors. I've had quite a lot of, of actors have sort of came forward who I've written to, as you can see. Um, and behind the camera workers. Um, so uh, Meg Theakston, for example, um, and then two other women, Linda McCarthy and Chrissy Cox, I'm in the process of sort of arranging interviews with. And my main case studies today are going to be Linda Beckett, uh, the actor, who is in five plays for today from 1973 to 1982, including Mike Lee's Hard Labour. I think you see her there with Alison Steadman. So Linda's on the left, Alison Steadman on the right. Uh, the writer Alma Cullen and uh, Meg Theakston. I don't have a picture of Meg, but she was director's assistant on The Sponges, uh, working with Roland Joffe. This is one of the most famous politically contentious plays for today that challenged um, the demonization of people on benefits. Now, um, here's the planned structure of my um, interview article. Um, that's the, the 5,000 word edited interview article. Um, I'm going to have an introduction to their careers, possibly including some production history stuff for specific productions they were involved with. Um, but this is all a work in progress. Um, first main section, um, experiences of gender in life and the television industry, and then experiences of social class in life and the television industry. And then more broadly, you know, work workplace um, issues and experiences experiences of trade unionism as well. So to begin with, in terms of gender, um, so Al McCullen, the writer, said that in those days, certainly men were always in powerful positions and women applying for jobs would be interviewed by a bank of men, you know, 12 men sitting down. And that was, um, I mean, that would have intimidated me if it had to go for that kind of job. And Meg Theakston, um, there were powerful women like, you know, Biddy Baxter, Anne Head, Anne Kirch, Margaret Matheson. I think if you had it, you could make it. Now, you could well say, you know, that men in suits were heads of department mostly. And I can't argue with that. In addition, I've heard harrowing accounts of sexual harassment by Linda Beckett and Claire Nielsen, which suggest actors were particularly exposed to this. So Linda claims that this was worse in theatre than in television, as the length of time you would spend with people created the conditions for it to occur. And Claire Nielsen also mentioned um, some cases of bullying in television. So I now have a um, brief clip from my second interview with Linda Beckett. Um, so hopefully this will work. Try it. Next question. So working as a woman in television from the 1970s onwards, um, have you ever encountered any barriers or discrimination? Um, well, just the generalisation, which is obvious, that there were better parts for men anyway than there were for mm. women. There were more parts for men than women. They were... Um, women tended to be the, the wife, the friend, you know, never the protagonist. It was always... Mm. Um, and of course that's changed a little bit more now um, but the women were often uh, well for me you know I, I, I was cast as a prostitute or perhaps you know some the secretary the you know um, because that's how they were written that most of the plays were written by men um, yeah. men, directors, men producers so but I was I was grateful to play <laughs> the prostitutes the um, less than moral characters. Um, a, it was a challenge, it was fun, it was great. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't ever think, oh, this is always how you're perceived as a woman, you know, uh, particularly. I mean, looking back now, you can see how characters for women were.
So uh, Linda spoke um, of her pleasure and also her conscientiousness in performing uh, a variety of roles, um, including a racist WPC, Barry Keefe's Waterloo Sunset, and a range of sort of working class women in uh, Mike Lee's Hard Labour and Dixie Williams' Vampires. So that takes us on to social class. Um, Alma Cullen, the writer, and um, she came from a working class background, was brought up on a council estate, uh, Page Moss in Highton, Merseyside. And she said they were um, very well designed houses. It was a very nice estate, but there was a lot of poverty on it. And she was born in 1938 when her dad was unemployed due to the Great Depression, having lost his job as a white collar clerk. He was the first in his family to be white collar. And then he'd been injured while pushing handcarts on the Liverpool docks when he broke his feet when a wall of packing cases fell on him. Um, her mother um, went on to do part time work in shops and later was full time at Hartley's Jam Factory. Now, this is quite similar to uh, Meg Theakston, who came from a working class family in East Sussex. Now, her mum had being the first ARP person in Sussex during the Second World War, while her dad was a lorry driver. And she said they weren't deprived, she wouldn't use that word, but money was tight. Anyway, um, Alma um, said that she was a very committed feminist and still is, but also that she didn't quite get a middle-class feminist angst um, because they'd had an expensive, long education um, and well, I thought most of the men I knew when I was young had infinitely worse lives than these women. And I couldn't quite square that with my view of the world, which was for me, um, was, was everybody's liberation. It wasn't just women's liberation. Now, Alma went on to talk about care workers of both genders today being the most hard done by people in the context of um, austerity and COVID-19. Now, despite her, her critique of what you could say is middle-class obliviousness uh, to the economic context working class people face, Alma was, was also careful not to idealize the working class and she feels she is caught between the two class worlds. And she told me like how social class was a theme that runs uh, through practically all of her extensive work for radio and television. Though including her play for today, Degree of Uncertainty from 1979, which actually got to the subject of adult education a year before Willie Russell's play Educating Rita was on stage and her screenplay from 1986 uh, Knowing the Score that is a really excellent uh, piece which shows middle class Edinburgh characters interacting with working class characters from Livingston um, and also class figures to varying degrees in her four episodes of Inspector Morse for ITV So on to um, the last topic of work issues and unions. Now, um, in terms of emotional labour, well, I found evidence from speaking to Meg Thiexton that some of the um, extensive emotional labour smoothing over conflict um, that Melanie Bell has perceived in the film industry, um, as Melanie was talking about during the BAFTS conference recently, um, this was there in television too, uh, with Meg Theakston, who was the director's assistant. Uh, she spoke of one particular play um, directed by Stephen Frears, where she had to help one of the male actors learn his lines. Um, and also, she spoke of, of having to uh, have extreme carefulness with tact and diplomacy in working with cert certain difficult directors on, on other projects. Now, in terms of pay, um, Meg said that she was paid overtime. Um, however, her pay was low overall. Um, she said that her pension now in a week exceeds her monthly pay back then. Um, whereas Claire Nielsen, um, the actor, um, said, I found out afterwards that I was paid less than half what my, what my male counterpart earned as an actor. Um, and Claire also um, discussed childcare, um, mentioning that directors could suddenly on a whim change rehearsal times, not giving a thought to women actors with children and their painstaking arrangements for childcare. 
In terms of trade unions, um, it's a very interesting mixed picture. Um, Meg Thiexton was a member of ABS, which is sort of the BBC staff union. Um, but she seems to fit the profile of a non-active member, um, echoing quite a few of the men I've spoken to who enjoy their work so much they don't countenance going on strike and are grateful to sort of be there doing, doing work that they love. Um, but she spoke of the emotional difficulty of breaking a strike, which you know she did once. She, she crossed a picket line in a PA strike of 1976. It was a very sort of complex experience there. Alma Cullen was always a member of the WGGB, uh, the Writers Guild of Great Britain, and felt they had fought very effectively to get TV companies to pay into a pension fund, which she is now receiving. Whereas um, Linda Beckett and Claire Nielsen were both equity members and felt it had often acted to help in cases of bad working conditions in, in theatres, say. Um, and uh, Claire mentions that they'd helped with two um, workplace injuries she'd had working in TV. So um, I have a few questions that people might be able to help, help me with here. Um, do you have any advice on how best I should shape the raw material that I have? Should I limit it to three specific case studies? I've mentioned more than three people in my paper there, I know. Um, two be all right, or, or four, you know, four or five. Um, is my division of it okay? So behind the camera elite, in front of camera, and behind the camera worker. And finally, um, this will tie into discussion of Moira Tate's work, is the designer an elite creative role or that of a worker? Thank you for listening. I'd be interested to receive any, any questions and um, be delighted to take, could take part in the ensuing discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. That was um, very good timing. So thank you very much. Um, it's really interesting to um, hear that you're, you're actually talking to women in, in very different roles uh, across the whole um, spectrum. So, um, oh, yes, I will start my camera. Um, and that you're also, you, you've obviously talked about class as well, which is something that came up in the, the earlier discussions that the, the women there tended to be middle or, or, or upper class, whereas your women are, are more um, across the spectrum. So that's very interesting as well. And, and thank you for bringing up the issue of how you structure your interview um, in the, the edited interview in the, in the journal. So um, I was struggling with something similar. So um, I think we'll, we'll pick that up in, in questions because I think that'll probably resonate with other people as well because it's, it's a, a different beast to a, a, a normal academic article. So thank, thank you very much. So we'll now move on to our second speaker, who is Jane Barnwell. So Jane is a reader in Moving Image at the University of Westminster, and she graduated from Leeds University and the Northern Film School, and then embarked on a career at the BBC um, before becoming a freelance production designer. Um, she's published widely on filmmaking and production design, and she's currently working on a monograph exploring the significance of the design of the home on screen, which is due for publication with Palgrave uh, Macmillan in 2021. Um, and Jane is going to be talking to us about interviewing the former BBC production designer, Moira Tate. And Moira did actually work on Some Place for Today, so there's a nice link with, with Tom's work, um, along with a lot of other dramas. So Jane's title is Invisible Design, interviewing Maura Tate, former BBC production designer. So over to you, Jane. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there's definitely, it's really interesting. There's so many overlaps today, but um, yeah, the play for today one is definitely there. Um, I, I am talking about invisible design, as has been mentioned, but um, I've actually changed the title to the designer's story, just because that kind of encapsulates the broader project that I've been working on. The focus of my talk today is um, my methodology for interviews, but also 
um, talking about specifically one of my interviewees, Moira Tate. I'm going to kind of talk about Moira's work a little bit at the beginning and then move on to talk about my interviews with designers to kind of um, highlight some of the issues and um, approaches that I've used that I've found helpful and explain why I've done that and how that's kind of come about. So um, starting off with Moira then, she pursued a career in production design at the BBC, as, as you can see here, and um, working in the 60s and 70s. Um, her design credits over the period include lots of classics that I remember watching growing up. Uh, things like Z Cars is a particular favourite of mine. Um, the Oneidan line as well, those kind of cosy Sunday, Sunday night um, viewings of, of that particular programme and called it as well. Um, Moira's subsequently been engaged in educating future production designers and uh, at the National Film and Television School. And she's in 2016, she was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the British Film Designers Guild. So um, as just a little mood board here to give you a, a flavor of some of the projects that she worked on. Um, as you can see, it's quite diverse in terms of the style. Um, we've got some series here, like the Oneidan Line and Called It's and Z Cars, your favourites. Um, we've also got um, some single plays, which Moira in her interviews was very keen to distinguish between the two and um, talk about how that was a very different kind of experience for her working on uh, standalone plays like there's a, um, a visit from Miss Prothero on here and also Sunset Across the Bay are two particular projects that she really enjoyed working on as, as one-offs. So um, the interview with Moira explores working practices at the BBC and talks about um, how these kind of familiar series um, actually shaped the visual landscape that we're so familiar with. Um, and the interview shines a light on valuable aspects of the history in terms of context of production and how this actually impacted on the visual language of television drama. Um, visual space constructed according to a BBC sensibility budget and schedule. So these are all aspects that as a designer are, are absolutely crucial. So Moira says, I didn't ever want a signature. I want to be at the service of the script and the character. I've got a great belief in invisible design. So there we go with that um, point about invisibility, which is um, really important to Moira. She, she really doesn't want to be, um, she doesn't want to be too showy. She doesn't want to be ostentatious with her design. She wants it to sit in a, um, in a very particular space stylistically. Um, here are some images that Moira very kindly uh, made available to me. Um, a props list, a floor plan, some interior drawings and some fabric swatches. And this was part of, this is very much part of my process when I'm interviewing, I, um, you know, I, I really try and look at artwork in addition to the conversations that I have. And that really helps form a kind of a, a way into certain, certain um, subjects. So um, Moira kind of got this approach that she talks about, which is creating real life from close observation. So as I say, she's really keen on that. And part of that was, um, things like photographing, that's very much part of her process. She says she takes a lot of photographs. She um, basically gives them to the, gave them to the painter to get the right finish, which she's very, very um, scrupulous about. But she's also pointing out in relation to budget, we didn't have much money, so we had to be very resourceful. Um, what you put in must enhance, but mustn't distract. So that's also talking about this um, notion of invisibility, which re reoccurred a lot in the conversation with Moira, but also with a lot of other designers who I've interviewed. Um, I don't look at other films as I want a new view. I think 
I, you know, she likes to look at, at life and I, and I love this. I will go for a wander and see what I can find. So that's really characteristic of her approach. She's not looking at other films. She's looking at real life um, to inform her designs. And I love the idea of her wandering around to see what she can find and um, inform how she's going to how she's going to um, actually create an environment. So then I've got a few um, points here in relation to how Moira works with the crew, um, with the prop buyer in particular here. She's talking about how the prop buyer um, operated in the team. Um, that's also something, although I do very much focus on the production designer, I'm very interested in the broader art department in addition to that, not just the production designer. So I'm looking at the production designer as the head of the art department. So um, Moira also likes to prepare lots of different options and alternatives when she's dressing. So when she's set decorating and she says, I used to rough dress everything, slightly overdress and then prove away until it's dressed for the camera. So she's very aware of the medium that she's designing for. She's aware of the camera and she's thinking very carefully about how to make that work um, and be as effective as possible in relation to the particular shows and, and um, one-off plays that she's working on. So yeah, Moira's approach I, I saw as being very organic, um, researching real life, helping her add depth and authentic texture to screen environments. So moving on a little bit then, I wanted to talk about the um, why I and why I started on this project really, which was um, very much to do with an absence that I saw. We're talking about the absence of women today, um, and this is also an absence in relation to product, the role of production design. So um, in this quote, you can see that there's this idea from the um, Journal of British Cinema and Television. There's this idea that there's a failure of media historians to actually address issues of visual style. And they're saying, you know, what is this? Why, what is the problem? And the conclusion is that, you know, maybe the scholar actually needs a very particular skill set in order to, to, um, to analyze this work effectively. So this quote acknowledges the difficulty surrounding the study of the subject and points to the absence of an appropriate language with which to discuss it. So issues coming out of that are things like I said, the lack of visibility of the production designer because they're very much at the service of the script. It's also the production designer's job to interpret the script for the screen and weave those visual elements together to create a coherent fictional universe. But there's a real paradox there in that tension that exists between the visible setting and the invisibility of their art. So as I say, visibility and invisibility comes up a lot in relation to uh, discussion uh, production design. So um, why, why did I embark on interviewing designers? I mean, I've already kind of stated it really, this lack of material in the first instance um, really drove me to want to actually um, gain more material. So um, I'm one of the first designers I actually went to interview was a designer called Christopher Hobbs. And um, he was very kind and spent a lot of time with me. Being quite honest, I wasn't quite sure what I was, um, what I was kind of doing in relation to my <laughs> research methodology. I've since discovered that I was following a qualitative uh, interview um, method, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. But yeah, I was actually, I had some very particular things I wanted to know from Christopher. And it was more based in the fact that I knew um, the tensions that existed when I was working on a project. And I really wanted to ask him about the solutions that he found in relation to those those same uh, kind of issues. And I, I just found it absolutely incredible talking to Christopher. It was really, as I say here, it was a thrill. He was very candid um, and I'd never heard anyone speak like that before about um, the things I was interested in, um, particularly 
as I say, in relation to the art department, which there was so little information still relatively then in 2000. Thankfully, there's a lot more coming through now. Anyway, I was hooked on um, interviewing designers. So then the study sample for the interviews was chosen in relation to the designers that I actually had access to. Um, and that's between the years of 1960 and, well, it's ongoing. So I've got <laughs> 2021 there. Uh, the case studies I've undertaken illustrate the production designer's purpose in, and the process very much in designing for the screen. Although each designer embodies an individual approach to their craft, they follow a very similar creative process and they're looking for ways of actually visualising the script on the screen uh, quite simply. So their responses to the script do vary enormously. Um, and that's what you know. this project that I've been working on really looks at. It looks at the common um, areas and it also looks at the individual areas and that's something that's been really interesting. But the recurring issues um, come up in production design to do with things to do with authorship, mise-en-scene, realism, authenticity. Um, wherever the designer sits in relation to this kind of continuum, if you like, of realism and expressionism, they always have the same problem. They have to create a screen environment that works with the drama that they're actually creating for. Um, so my contribution stems from a practitioner's point of view and an understanding of the process of interpreting and the way a script is actually realized for the screen. A bit more detail here about my um, interviews in terms of they were participated voluntarily um, they're conducted in person occasionally on the phone um, recently they've been on the phone unfortunately via uh, zoom or skype um, the setting you prior to covid the setting was in the designer's home which was really nice it created a really nice kind of comfortable rapport um, and sometimes on set and on there's pros and cons to both of those but Obviously on set, you get to see the artwork and you get to see them in action, if you like. So the content of the interviews was flexible to allow for exploration of each of the subjects um, perspectives. Um, a list of standard questions served as the spine of the investigation. And as I say, my own practice informed the nature of the investigations. Things like, you know, the tension between a budget, a schedule and a creative vision, the process of finding and agreeing design solutions to script problems and dealing with the obstructions that the production process throws in your path. Um, ethics and release forms were used as standard um, and drafts were agreed before publication. Um, I'm a bit aware of time here, so I'm not sure I'm going to read this whole section on oral history. I think everyone today is very aware of the importance of oral, oral history, so um, I'm going to skim over that. Point of view is really important in my project. I'm really interested, as I say, in the particular point of view of the designer. Um, the method employed, I learned after my first interview, <laughs> was... Uh, you as it kind of falls into the definition used for qualitative research, which is this unstructured in-depth interviewing. Um, this enabled this enables researchers to get close to the people they're investigating. And I really found that helpful. Um, one of the favorite techniques of this approach is an unstructured interview um, because it allows considerable latitude for interviewees. The possible rambling that can result from this approach is considered beneficial as it, it, it can actually add and take you in interesting and unusual directions. So very open technique that I employed and um, interestingly research academic Alan Bryman actually says that this approach is very much um, favouring the subject's point of view. Um, which is absolutely spot on because, as I say, my project is called The Designer's Story and it's all about making from the perspective of the production designer. So that really resonates for me with my aims and objectives. Um, and I take the stance that my position is subjective and define it distinctively as the designer's story. So their point of view is the point of my research. So I'm very open about the subjectivity of that position. 
Um, within the conversations, the points that reoccurred began to form a narrative, a shared language, and the designers were voicing mutual concerns, which revolved around what I identified as five strands that then provided the core elements of a model I've subsequently developed for the analysis of production design. Um, the results are illustrated in my last book, Production Design for the Screen, and I've carried on building on that. As I say, I am hooked on interviewing designers, so it, it continues. It's very much a work in progress. Making visible, yeah, so just to round off, my work incorporates the intentions of the production designer into a discussion of a finished production. Um, I think that's really important, and I... I you know, a lot of times you read um, analysis of film and TV and it doesn't include the production process. And I really want to, it's lovely today hearing all about the, the, um, the histories and the research that's going on um, because I, I think that's absolutely wonderful and it can, it can only enrich the area. So a holistic view in positioning the production design in terms of recurring practices across a wide range but also with the intention of reinforcing the evidence of the way in which their work contributes to a project. So really, yeah, making the production designer's presence visible in terms of their conceptual interpretation of the story. And the production designer is often key in the creation of the visual story as it appears on the screen, as we know. And the aim here is to actually render the production designer visible in our reading of those images. So that's really a very, um, a kind of whistle stop tour through my through my uh, work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jane. That's that's um, a really interesting talk. And really, I was really struck by actually how important it is that you are an expert interviewer as well. I think. Um, other people wouldn't have got the the richness from from um, somebody like Moira because you were able to talk to her um, with that that insider knowledge about how production design works. Um, and thank you very much for sharing your interview approach as well. I think I think that's a, a rich area that we'll we'll pick up on in the discussion um, because all all those things about how you go about it, um, the stages are all really important. So thank you very much for, for that contribution. So our final speakers today are um, Kristen Gorton and Mark Helsby. So Kristen is Professor of Film and Television in the Department of Theatre, Film, Television and Interactive Media at the University of York. And she's published widely on feminist theory, television, film and emotion. And her latest book, Remembering Television, British Television, Audience, Archive and Industry, it was published by the BFI and Bloomsbury in 2019. And she's currently working on a, a book length project about Sally Wainwright. Um, and she is joined by Mark Helsby, who is a PhD candidate um, and is supervised by Kristen. And Mark has a, P a BBC production um, background and worked for a long time in the entertainment department of BBC Studios and was series producer for Mastermind. So lots of difficult questions there. Um, and they're moving away from drama. We've had we've had quite a lot of discussion on with drama today, um, but we're we're very much moving away from that and into what was called youth TV. Um, so, and the title of their paper is "It Was Bauhaus Without Realising We Were Bauhaus: BBC Women and Youth Programming in the North." Over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Vanessa, and thanks to Hannah and Elka for making all this possible. Um, our paper overlaps with Tom, so I'm sure there's gonna be a lot to pick up in the discussion um, and with Jane's in terms of thinking about interviewing style. Uh, this talk was somewhat of a challenge to write as we have so much material that we would like to share and very little time to share it, but we'll do our best to give you a sense of what we've learned from our interviews with eight television professionals who worked either during Janet Street Porter's time in youth programs at the BBC in Manchester or just after. 
Um, we decided to focus on this period because it proved to be a very fertile training ground for these women. And what we hope to explain today are some of the reasons why this time proved so valuable and then go on to discuss um, some of the key issues the interviews have provoked, namely the issue of motherhood and having a TV career and the impact of class in terms of working in the TV industry. But first I'm going to turn over to Mark who will briefly contextualize the period. So um, Janet Street Porter was poached from LWT's Network 7 in 1987 by Alan Yentob to form the Youth Programmes Department for the BBC based at Television Centre in London. And in the early 90s, it was announced the department would move to BBC North, a new broadcasting house on Oxford Road in Manchester, in a very early move by the BBC to diversify its production bases out of the capital. Um, in this time, the uh, the department's output was predominantly broadcast under the DEF2 brand, a uh, twice weekly stripping of youth programming on BBC Two. Uh, when the department was initially formed, many staff followed Janet to the BBC from LWT, but after the move north, many of those founding figures left and were replaced in part by the women we interviewed. Uh, Janet left in 1994 and was replaced by John Whiston, by which time the department's output had expanded to include more mainstream programming, prompting it to be renamed Youth and Entertainment Features. Only two of the women we interviewed were originally from the North, but none of them were from London. Helen Bullock, who is now head of the BBC's children's in-house production, believed that Janet was a trailblazer for the industry at this time. She said Janet ran it and she was very interesting in terms of the impact that she made on the industry in terms of her inclusive recruitment. So if you think about the content that we were making for the audience that we were making it for and the teams who were making that content, they were probably the most diverse and inclusive teams that actually would be the envy of many companies now. I think that was extraordinary. Another of our interviewees was an old producer of mine, Liz Molyneux, who worked in daytime programming at BBC North before joining the youth department and was inspired by the women in leadership roles around her, telling us, I'd characterise the opportunity for women to progress within the youth programming department as incredibly positive. I think the leads in that department, I could imagine being them because they were all around me. You have to see it in order to believe it, don't you? They were pretty feisty about it, about being women in positions of power. Liz Warner, uh, who later founded Betty Productions before serving three years as CEO of Comic Relief, told us about being interviewed by Janet for her first role at the BBC after a drunken night out with a series producer and being given the job on the basis of being able to keep up with him and contrasted Janet's approach to that of her successor, John Whiston, saying, John was the professor probably and Janet was probably the crazy headmistress who started the school and you know, but without her vision, it wouldn't be there. And although we started this project in thinking about gender as a key characteristic that affects women in, in the television industry, underpinned by research by Percival, Hesmond Halsh, Gill, McRobbie, O'Brien Johnson, Bell, Ball and Lehman among others, instead what all of the respondents raised was the impact that class had on them. Uh, Liz Molyneux, who describes herself as a chippy northerner, talked to us about her experience working as a commissioner in Television Centre in London later in her career, and the feeling that she was being excluded from some conversations, particularly when senior people in production were having dinner and going to the Groucho Club, and she was outside that. Liz Warner also spoke about being on the outside of things while she was at Channel 4, and she said, I think the problem isn't women, I think it is probably class and background. When I was walking with a senior male executive, he said to me, oh, I know blah and blah and blah, and I said, how do you all know each other? And he said, well, because we all went to Westminster. I was so naive, I still couldn't quite work out why I didn't know anybody because I've gone to school in Loughborough and then gone to Manchester. So I still think that those networks are really powerful and I still think there's a snobbery between London and Manchester. I still, I think that has become a bigger issue than gender. Okay, um, in their article published in 2020 titled Erasing Diversity, Beth Johnson and Dave Forrest note, that while the BBC's diversity and inclusion is arguably a positive step in recognizing and working to level the landscape for women, BAME, LGTB, and or disabled employees at the BBC, it is important to note the absence of social class as a marker for issues connected to diversity and inclusion in these targets. They cite Rianne Jones's piece in Does the BBC Care About Class, in which she argues that attempts to improve diversity rarely include attention 
to how socioeconomic background can influence success. Jones goes on to cite a 2014 report by the Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission, which found that a third of BBC executives had attended Oxford or Cambridge, compared to 1% of the public as a whole. Similarly damning is the fact that 88% of the public went to a comprehensive, but just 37% of BBC executives did. And the research here from Jones, Forrest and Johnson chimes with the interviews we've conducted. For example, Rebecca Papworth told us a story about speaking in a meeting with senior men in London, and one of those men openly turning to his neighbor, announcing, I can't understand a word she's saying, which reinforced her belief that class is a major issue in the industry. I, I don't think the slides are still going, Mark. Is this about to come? Okay. She told us, if you walk into a room where everybody knows each other, because they all went to the same school or they all live in the same place, you are the outsider. To belittle, to try and humiliate, all that is absolutely trying to push you out, isn't it? I said to myself with that one, how hard must I have worked to get to that table? This is a very powerful question and one that underlines the challenges working class women continue to face in the British TV industry. Helen Bullock was quite open about her own background and the impact she felt it had on her early career. Um, and she said, there weren't many people, many people from Kirkati whose dad made Lino working for the BBC when I joined it. Actually, the fact that I was clearly from a working class background was probably the thing that people noticed before my gender because it was poss possibly more unusual. Many of our inter interviewees clearly felt on the outside, and yet moving to youth programming under Janet Street Porter allowed them to feel as though they belonged. And even more importantly, being outside things under a particular style of leadership created a space to flourish. For example, Liz Molyneux told us, I think it was because we were outside of London. I think it was geographic as one of the contributors to that. So I think it was the freedom of being outside of the leadership elite and the freedom to take risks. And so by definition, that allowed people to blossom, try things out and be themselves more than fitting into a mold of people that they see around them. Liz Warner reiterates that when she, when she told us, it felt like basically we were the naughty kids that had taken over the building. So yeah, it was probably a school without us realizing. It was Bauhaus without realizing we were Bauhaus. One area where several of our interviews did feel their gender was important was peer support groups. Pam Cavana, who became a commissioner and channel executive at the BBC, where she commissioned Pointless, among others, talked about having a network of female peers who she could talk openly and frankly with. And this chimes with my wider PhD research on the ways that knowledge is transferred across generations in the industry and in the BBC in particular. Certainly for Helen Buller, those, con those uh, connections were vital. She told us that women's networks have grown up fast and firm, and that has benefited the cross fertilization of ideas and support in a way that, to be honest, I don't think more male skewing networks have. And so I think that's been a really, really interesting phenomenon. Uh, given the time constraints, I just want to touch on two final issues, that of motherhood and that of care. Bridget Bosley, who's the creative director at WAG Entertainment and a former controller of Factual at ITV and head of features and formats at the BBC, mm. described a very stressful situation where she was stuck in a massive traffic jam and her mobile phone wasn't working. So she had to leave her car, run down a three lane motorway, searching for someone who had a phone and could contact the nursery. She described the experience in great detail and it was clearly a traumatic experience for her and one that is familiar to so many working mothers. The difficulty, as she explained it, is that in working for television, there are not set hours and the work is often predictable, unpredictable and demanding in ways that makes juggling kids and career particularly difficult. In the end, she employed a nanny, but recognized that this option would not be available to everyone. And secondly, in the interview with Helen Bullock, she mentioned not wanting colleagues to characterize her as a mother figure. She explained, I care about the content and I care about the audience, but I think if people are gender stereotyping and expect it all to be a bit, a bit sort of warm and cuddly, but never get the hard truths, then I think this is an outmoded concept really when it comes to women in leadership. Bullock's re reflection on gender and care are not only useful in better understanding women in leadership, but also add to the growing body of research 
on the discourse of care and emotional labor um, that Melanie Bell has talked about and which Tom referred to in his paper. I mean, uh, so over the course of my industry career, I conducted hundreds of interviews for broadcast with everyone from the producer of Titanic to unsuccessful Dragon's Den entrepreneurs. But these were my first academic interviews. I think the essentials of the task are the same, knowing what you want to ask and having a broad understanding of what you anticipate they'll tell you, while staying alert to the casual aside that opens up a new line of inquiry you hadn't expected and then following where that leads you. There were some interesting dynamics in each of the interviews. Some of the women I count as good friends and some I hadn't spoken to for almost 20 years. Certainly the fact that they all knew me definitely helped. We shared a common shorthand and they didn't have to contextualize the characters who came up in their stories. But I think those I hadn't spoken to for a long time were probably the most forthcoming. Those who are now out of the industry also seem to able to speak more frankly about their experiences and how they hope to see the industry change than those who are still working and still mindful of who might read their contributions. The other thing that came out of these interviews, which chimes with the theme of my PhD research, was that none of the participants felt their own careers were remarkable or that their knowledge and memories were particularly worthy of being formally captured for future generations of program makers or researchers. And I suspect this might also be a class driven issue that the daughter of a lino maker from Kirkcaldy isn't considered as important as the son of a banker from the home counties or that a career making format or factual entertainment isn't as valuable as one making drama. But my next round of interviewees is with current practitioners which I hope will show that the older cohorts experiences still hold value. And within those next interviews are program makers who've entered the industry through the Mama Youth Apprenticeship Scheme and the BBC's regional talent pools which will hopefully shed light on how those professional networks that our interviewees value uh, can develop in an, uh, in an era of precarity and fleeting professional relationships and whether an Oxbridge connection is still as valuable uh, in a more diversified and regionalised industry. Thank you both very much. That is really interesting. Um, and particularly the, the differences between having a, a network programme based in the regions um, and whether that, that gives a different um, experience and, and advantage for, for um, working class or, or more inclusive um, programmers. So, um, and also your experience as a, again, um, an interviewer who knew personally the people you were interviewing and how that was was a help so um we're getting a lot of different perspectives on on how best to, to conduct these interviews um and yeah I, I find most of the interviews i i do i know the people or or they know of me and it, it does it really short circuits things and makes things much much easier so some really interesting perspectives there um, so thank you to all our speakers. So we'll now hear from Elke Weissman, who um, is going to respond to what we've heard in this second um, panel. And Elke is a, a reader in film and television at Edge Hill, and she's published widely on issues of gender in television scholarship, transnational television drama, audiences and women's relationship with television. So Elka, can you let us know what, what you, how you respond to, to what we've been listening to this afternoon? Absolutely. First of all, thank you very much for this wonderful paper. And then I also wanted to just quickly say that it was all Hannah's work who's organised this. Um, she's literally just asked me to respond, so I didn't do anything. Um, so thank you to Hannah for organising this and asking me to respond. So one of the things that really struck me in all the papers um, is how important access is. Um, it came out out of all of your papers. Tom, um, your overview of the incredible amount of people that you've contacted and the rather immediately responses that you're still getting, unfortunately, highlights precisely how um, valuable our, you know, networks or if we do have a network, how easy, how much easier it is to get access to um, interviews um, and interviewees. And obviously, you know, um, Jane highlighted that as well in terms of 
you know, because this is your background, um, you were a production designer, you can speak to them in a different way, but you also um, much more easily can access these people. Similarly, you know, um, Mark highlighted how many of your interviewees were people that you knew. Now, um, it also is one of those things that obviously ha Hannah in one of her comments actually in the chat um, as, as we were talking highlighted how the, um, once you have a first point of access, how that then allows us to access other people. But as other people have highlighted, other scholars have highlighted before, to some extent that causes a bit of a problem because you do end up skewing the sample a little bit. Um, so, you know, it's the people that, you know, it's the people that get on um, that will come in, you know, or speak to those people, speak to those people, speak to those people, which means that some of those um, histories that we're trying to make visible um, potentially continue invisible. And in that regard, obviously, um, you know, getting access to the people who've been marginalized um, is then potentially particularly difficult. In that regard, um, Kirsten, uh, Kristen's and Mark's um, point about um, the intersectionality of um, gender and class, but you know, maybe also gender and stability or gender and race, or indeed all of those together, um, strikes me as um, really um, one of those things that we need to be particularly aware of. How do we get access to people um, who, you know, are not part of the democracy that, to some extent, um, is, you know, also facilitating actually production in the first place? Because we know that um, the reason why these people work with each other again and again and again and know each other so well is because um, they, they need to have um, people to work with um, that they can get on with because everything else is so stressful. But what does that mean for people who were only there for a short period of time? How do we get to make their stories visible? And in terms of questions of visibility and invisibility, which were obviously also really, really important to Jane's talk, um, what really strikes me as well is, you know, how can we make things visible when we, how, how can we make things visible as researchers who might only have a certain amount of experience of something or indeed no experience at all? Um, I was really struck by the fact that Tom managed to speak to women about sexual harassment, about bullying, about imbalances of power within, um, and you know, gendered um, imbalances of power um, in the BBC um, in his interviews, particular, you know, because often it's easier to disclose these things to people that you know better. In that regard, and I've kind of um, warned all the speakers about this, um, I'm also wondering what does it mean to make or to, to um, have a methodology that is feminist in itself. Um, interviews seem really, really helpful, but one of the things that Jane also highlighted is how much of the work that is being done is collaborative. So um, how much, um, you know, the points that um, Kristen and Mark highlighted, how much peer support networks were important for the women. Um, one of the things um, that Heather Sutherland found when she conducted research into uh, women at the BBC in the 1970s and 80s was that um, she brought some of the women together in focus groups and some of them she interviewed. And the focus groups um, were really fascinating for her because she found that the women ended up using those focus groups nearly like feminist consciousness raising groups where things were suddenly articulated that couldn't be articulated before. So in that regard, um, what role might other methodologies um, that nevertheless are oral histories um, play in us basically making visible uh, what remains invisible and providing a feminist approach um, and method? Um, and with that, I want to hand back to the speaker. 
Thanks very much, Elka. That, that's um, really interesting that, that you've, you've picked up on, on those aspects. So I'd like to ask each of the speakers in turn to um, address the, the points that um, Elka has raised. So particularly about access, about that intersectionality of gender and class and, and that paradox that we, we came up against time and again about visibility and invisibility. Um, so Tom, can we, we kick off with, with you? Well, I mean, in terms of access, it, it is often it is often far harder to get those people who aren't necessarily in the Oxbridge networks um, to come forward. Um, it is a very difficult issue, like in terms of um, ethnicity as well, and getting in touch with enough Black, Asian, and minority ethnic actors. Um, I'm making a conscious effort to do better on that, and I've been able to so far. Really, um, I've got another batch of letters I'm going to be sending out. Um, so the access is is very tough. Um, in terms of gender and class, it was very interesting to hear from Linda Beckett um, about her own background, which she described as, as, as very middle class, really, um, in the sort of suburb of Manchester, um, and having a very um, a background that was very immersed in the arts, in the sort of local arts scene and everything, and how it was for her to play working class characters. There's a lot of very interesting discussion on that. Um, it very structured. Um, it, I mean, I wouldn't say these were unstructured interviews, but I suppose that was in the second interview, um, and she um, got increasingly comfortable. You know, the longer we talked, in opening up more, I think. Um, so that was that was definitely in the second interview where we mm. talked about these deeper topics, really, uh, rather than the production history side, sort of in the first interview um, with Linda. And. Um, in terms of focus groups, I hadn't really thought of that until until yesterday. Um, it could be could be a great idea. I mean, if possibly easier easier to do um, once um, the situation with the pandemic ch changes, I, I would imagine. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe just supplement the more sort of life story type um, process of doing the individual interview. It might be a great way of getting more dialogue. Um, between the different uh, w w women involved. And um, Tom, how were you actually physically doing your interviews during during COVID? Um, well, a mixture really of Zoom and phone call. Um, and the phone call I just put on speakerphone and then record it on another device. Um, and apparently they're really good quality recordings that the person who's transcribing them tells me. Um, the odd one on Skype, but that really wasn't as good. And there's one or two where there was like really poor quality recording on Skype. So just as an advice thing, that's not one to, to, to try and use really. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're virtually all Zoom and uh, phone call really. And are you doing those full oral histories or are they semi-structured interviews? I would say they are probably a bit of both. Um, they're, they're certainly not unstructured because I give them a list of uh, around about 20 questions beforehand. Um, and I'm able to sort of send them material as well that they've been in. So they're able to that refresh memories and have a, you know, a new discussion about what this material means now, um, these programs from the 70s and 80s. Um, so there's that, there's that element of it. Um, I've answered the question or was there? Yeah, no, no, that's great. So, um, so actually pretty directed interviews. I've found that you, it's very difficult to do a full oral history um, on the phone or via Zoom because, because the time constraint isn't the same as if yeah. you're on yeah. the phone, um, either. Yeah, I mean, audio or I just limited it really to, to, to talking about, asking them about their experiences in their life of social class gender, particularly in the industry, but, but allowing them to be a bit more open than that as well. Um, and the educational background and what the parents did. Um, so that there's elements of that life story um, interview that I've, I've taken, but I'm not, I'm not doing it sort of in quite as much depth as, as they're done for BEHP uh, ones that 
I've, I've seen online that are all excellent and fascinating. Um, <laughs> like massive depth about their, every step of their lives. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. And, and how was it, you know, framing um, questions about things like sexual harassment for, for you as a, as a white man? I wouldn't say it was it was it was easy really no um and yeah I wasn't comfortable really doing that in the first first discussion with them but you know, I was I was able to send them the questions beforehand and you know they were aware they were going to be asked about it so it wasn't yeah you know, wasn't sprung on them at all it was it was sort of a tacit agreement that that, that I would ask about it and then the follow-up but yeah in the first round of interviews in 2020 I didn't really touch on that that's been in 2021 that I've sort of taken this further and spoken in more depth. Brilliant, thank you. And it, it's, yeah, it's often about building that relationship, isn't it? And then you can go back to people and, and ask more questions or, or explore other areas. So um, Jane, can, can you respond to, to Elka's observations? Yeah, yeah, before I do, just to say though, I, I think um, on that point about doing interviews over the phone or, and, uh, or Zoom or whatever, I actually um, realized recently that there is a benefit, even though I would much prefer to do it face to face in that you've got a really nice clean, like you were just saying, Tom, you've got a really nice clean audio track that you, because a lot of my interviews, there's, it can't really, there's little sound bites that I can share with people, but really there's, we're usually in a cafe or a, um, in someone's house, as I say, or, or we're in, we're actually in the studio, so it's usually really noisy. But yeah, I just wanted to mention that there's definitely <laughs> advantages to doing that phone call thing that you're, you're saying. And um, in terms of access, I would say that um, as I've gone on, I've, my access has increased, um, and that's a really fair point. But just to um, kind of reassure people as well, I think when I started, I, the people I was talking to didn't know I didn't know them and they didn't know me and I actually contacted most people through you probably most people here are aware of um two publications called Cares and the knowledge basically just for anyone who isn't familiar with them it lists everybody who works in production and um, it also has all sorts of other really useful things in there um you know, location, information, facilities, houses, camera and lighting and things like that. But I actually just, you know, I just contacted people directly through um, their listings in, in either case or the knowledge. And most of them actually um, were prepared to talk to me. So I don't know if that says something about the art department in particular. Um, I can see some like obviously actors are, are a whole different kind of um, scenario, I imagine. But yeah. So that's um, what I would say about that. Um, in terms of uh, class, I, I'm really fascinated by what people are saying about that. That hasn't been a, a focus of my work, but I would love to, um, I, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. So, um, but I haven't got any real insight to, to add on that um, from what I've done so far, but I, I would definitely consider building that into future future interviews um, and in terms of focus groups it's, it sounds brilliant I've never ever um, actually uh, conducted a focus group so I don't have any experience of that but um, it sounds really positive and I would love to have a go and again I even wonder if it might work on a zoom scenario um, but um, in answer also to that kind of the other side of that question, Vanessa, I think um, there's a real intimacy with a one-to-one -one interview. And I really love that. And as I say, I really got kind of hooked on that. Um, so I think it sounds like there's definite benefits to that focus group model that you're talking about. So I would definitely like to try that, but I would still carry on with my one-to-one -one interviews because as I say, there's just that intimacy and that rapport that you can establish. And like you mentioned, you can go back and talk to them again, as long as the interview went okay <laughs> and kind of carry on that conversation. So um, yeah, I think that's all the points you raised. 
Lovely. And the, the postscript model, I think, is a really interesting one because people do bounce off each other. Um, the ADAPT project from Royal Holloway used that to good effect that you can see in some of their videos, which are, are on YouTube if you if you search for them. They got everybody who had worked on this outside broadcast together just talking about the experience. So they, they recreated this outside broadcast and then um, spoke to them all um, there was one woman amongst the whole crew. She was the PA, obviously. Okay, um, thank you very much for that. So, um, Mark and Kristen, how, oh, actually, before we, we move on from you, Jane, how did you respond to Tom's question about production designers? Are they a, um, an elite or, or not? Or are they workers? So I suppose, are they above or below the line? Oh, um, well, they consider themselves very much like the invisible below the line kind of um, workers. And most of them don't want to be visible. Um, they don't want to sort of, you know, I'm arranging an event at the moment with speakers from design and it's quite, um, not that many of them want to be in the spotlight. So, um, uh, I think they see themselves very much as, as, as workers, like as part of an industrial process, but also part of, you know, they're very proud of their craft as well. Um, but I don't know many that um, kind of sit in that elite necessarily. Um, but they're kind of a bridge, aren't they, between yeah. the, the crafts people, mm. um, the scene crew and the painters and everybody else and, and the director and producer. So. I, they have a lot of leadership responsibility. So I would have thought technically they should probably go above the line, not below. Mm, um, yeah. So seeing how you see them positioning themselves. Yeah, it's a really good point. It's really interesting. It's, I think it's genuinely probably quite ambiguous. Um, uh, certainly thinking about people I've spoken with, um, but yeah, I, I'll ponder that one. <laughs> and did you find that actually Moira and, and the other production designers you've, you've interviewed have kept a lot of the materials? Because a lot of the women who are production designers who I've interviewed have got extensive scrapbooks where they've curated the whole production. They've got all the publicity photos, they've got their original drawings, they've got photographs from, from on set, you know, they've got the whole lot. And um, that's a yeah. common experience around production designers. Um, you're really lucky. I'm really jealous, actually. Um, no, a lot of the time they don't. And in fact, someone who I was interviewing recently, Sarah Greenwood, was saying, you know, it just everything gets scrapped and she just starts again. But um, which made me weep. But um, <laughs> what she has got is a fantastic collection of onset photos. Um, so once something's dressed, she's got photos of it. So you can get a sense of how it looked rather than necessarily how it was photographed, but how the set was actually, um, how it, you know, is, is it in, a, in that sense. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of them just uh, kind of get rid of stuff. And in fact, they kind of say that's not the point. They actually, a lot of them feel quite strongly that it's about the end product. Um, it's about what ends up helping tell the story or enhance understanding of character rather than the artwork itself. Um, but saying that some people are, have got some lovely artwork. Um, Stuart Craig is one person who has beautiful um, pencil drawings, illustrations, but it's really varied. But it'd be fantastic if they all kept it, but um, a lot of them don't. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, yeah, moving on to Mark and, and Kristen um, in response to, to Alka's points. I think um, we hadn't thought about doing focus groups for this at the moment. Um, and as I said in the presentation, this is my first round of, um, of academic interviews I've done, but I've done lots in the industry. And I think what I found then when we would try and do that kind of formal interview with more than one person is invariably one person you know, one of the group would dominate the conversation. Um, and maybe you'd just end up getting, everyone kind of reached a consensus, but you don't necessarily get those contrasting views. Um, 
And what was interesting with these ones, as I said in, again in the presentation, a couple of the people, Liz Warner, I hadn't spoken to for 20 years. Um, and I think the the level of my sort of being a you know, being a friend, if you like, of hers is is just like I was a name that she remembered uh, when I made the approach, but I had no means of actually getting in touch with her. So I had to go through sort of LinkedIn, and then that didn't work. So going down the line of other people who I knew were still in touch with her and, and and tracing those routes. Um, but she then got back in touch with me at the end and said she'd found it a sort of very therapeutic thing to do. That's where that quote of hers came about it being Bauhaus that realizing she said she kept saying in the interview I'd never really thought about it like this um, and it, it made her kind of go back 20 years in her own memories and think about how that department was what the relationships were who the people were there and reflect on it a bit more because she said right at the start I'm not someone who looks back on my career and that's kind of something that they all said really is you know I'm, I'm more interested in what's next um, so I was kind of dragging them reluctantly back to think about those times. And then they were all going, oh, do you, do you remember when we did this? So um, I think that's really kind of experience that. when you do an oral history with somebody that you, you're actually forcing them to reflect and mm. contextualise their, their career. Yeah. I think it also picks up on Helen Wheatley's point that she made in the chat that it might have something to do with television and television's drive for the next thing. Um, so it might be particular to the medium as well, which is an interesting thing to to think about further. Yeah, absolutely. So Alka, have you got any responses to the responses? Not really, thank you very much for this. Um, I think um, this is this is the thing, isn't it? It's that there are so many elements that need to be considered in terms of methodology, in terms of, um, I, I think Jane, you're absolutely right that you get a level of intimacy in an interview which means um, you can dip deeper into the personal history, but considering, you know, for some particular, I think for, uh, this, is, this is what Heather did for the kind of more worker status um, the contributors, it was really helpful to come together as a group because they used to work together um, and they were, you know, they were all basically um, sharing their, their, that history of, actually we were harassed, we were bullied, we were constantly belittled, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think both methods can be really helpful, but they need to be, you need to consider quite a lot of things in terms of precisely also wh who, who is this group? How do they relate to each other? And is there potentially one person who speaks more than others? So if you bring workers and, um, you know, uh, elite together, then you end up, inevitably with the elite point of view, I think. Um, but that takes me back precisely to that question of intersectionality, which I think is really, really important. And it's really great to see that this is being addressed by so many of you. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got roughly eight minutes left. So I'm just going to run through some of the questions that have been posted in the chat. So the first one was from Non Williams for Jane. And it's really enjoyed your explanation of your methodology and how you've approached the interview. I'm interested in the less structured interview favoring the subject's point of view. Could you please confirm the name of the academic you mentioned who promoted this type of interview? Oh yeah, that's, um, that's Alan Bryman. Brilliant, thank you. And another one, quick one for you. So this is from Janet McKay. I'm interested in the comment Jane made about the skill set of the researcher. Can the participants say something about how their skill set, training, education, professional experience shapes, uh, sorry, shapes positionality, um, what they see, which is new? In short, the question extends the insider comment. Do you want me? Do you want me to repeat a bit of that, Jane? With no, no. I'm just sorry. I'm just thinking. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting because um, obviously that's like the other side of <laughs> the other end of the lens that I'm talking about, because I'm talking about the point of view for me is it's on the designer and then that's turning it around absolutely and saying, you know, what about the person asking those questions? Um, and I think it's obviously whoever's asking the questions it's I, I think that you're going to get different answers and that's why I think it's the more histories the more um, work the better 
you know, because then you can actually tease out a kind of um, different perspectives, really, which I, I'm really fascinated by. Perspective is, is, you know, it's how you frame something, isn't it? So I'm really interested. But I also do think it is important to let people know where you are coming from as an interviewer or researcher or, or whatever it is because, um, and just make that really transparent. So yeah, that's my take on that one, I think. And when you're approaching people to be interviewed, how much do you tell them about yourself? And do you give the, the questions in advance like, like Tom does or, or not? I don't know. Um, I'm really horrible like that. <laughs> I don't give them any clues whatsoever. Um, but uh, I it depends who it is, I suppose, is the honest answer. If, you know, it's some people like Moira, I've known Moira um, for quite a long time now and we've had lots of different conversations. So she knows exactly what I'm about. Um, whereas with someone else, I, don't, I wouldn't need to sort of preface anything now when I was talking to her, but with someone else, um, uh, yeah. I mean, I interviewed an American designer recently who does all of Nancy Meyer's. Um, films, uh, John Hutman, and um, I had to sort of kind of tell him a little bit of my background because it, it was, he was kind of starting at a very basic level, the sort of things he was telling me. So sometimes I think it's counterproductive to not explain yourself a little bit, as I found out in that particular instance. But other times I just, I really am like really free flowing, which as I say, started kind of as an accidental, <laughs> not knowing what I was doing and then starting to think, actually, this is getting some really interesting material and kind of <laughs> sort of uh, justifying that approach. I've kind of carried on like that really, I think. Thank you. And Tom's asked a specific question, actually. He would be he wants to know about how Moira found dressing sets on location compared with the studio, um, because he thinks her plays for today were totally on, on location. Uh, um, she loves the real world is the best, sort of best answer to that, I would say. She loves being out and actually um, using the real world. But Having said that, she she kind of um, a lot of things that you might think look like they're in the real world. She's actually she would love to hear you say that actually because she's taken detail from um, the real world and and recreated it in the studio. So, um, but the play for today, the sunset across the bay one. Um, a lot of that was, um, I know she absolutely loved working on that and she was, she was more interested in the dressing than, than the setting for that. She's really interested because she said she spoke with, um, with him really closely um, about his parents because it's about his parents and talking about what bed would they have what chairs would they have and actually kind of that sort of thing so it was the set decoration I think was I would say was at the forefront of her mind rather than whether it was a studio build or a real location she seemed very very um preoccupied with getting the the bed and, and those kind of key pieces of furniture right lovely um, and then moving on, we've got a, a couple of questions for Mark. Um, so Daniel Gordon wanted to know, how did ageism intersect with what you've said about class and gender in perceptions of BBC youth programmes? And Janet Street Porter faced a lot of criticism for her age. Uh, I think I remember a line on spitting image about silly old me in charge of youth. Or, um, yeah, I can't do the accent. Um, <laughs> Was that because it had taken many years to work her way into a senior position because of the barriers she faced or because of a Generation X backlash against baby boomers trying to stay young? I think um, I think when Janet came to the BBC, she'd been working in the media for getting on for nearly 20 years by that point. I, my time in the department was just as John Whiston was taking over was when I started, so I just missed Janet. Um, but the vast majority of the people who were working in that department at the time were under 30. Um, and I think that was one of the criticisms that would be in the press at the time about the programmes that, that 
they thought that was a reason why it didn't necessarily look like the rest of telly. Um, but something, again, something that the other interviewees talked about is how they'd have competitions amongst themselves of who could do the most outrageous thing in the titles. So for the Rough Guides was one of the series that was made a travel series. Um, they blew a car up, I think they said, in, at the start of one of them. So each programme would try to outdo each other. And all those rules had kind of gone. And that's the sort of thing that, that both Liz Warner and Liz Molyneux were talking about, that they were kind of out of sight, out of mind, in Manchester, out of the way. And the, it may be apocryphal, the story was that there was an ongoing competition between the production teams in Manchester and BBC Press down in London, where in Manchester they'd be sort of ramping up the colour and ramping up the contrast and the volume, and in London they'd be turning it back down again. Um, so that, that you know, stuff was deliberately bright and the, the graphics were deliberately garish and they got a lot of criticism for the graphics that they used. Um, a couple of interviews, interviews made the point, if you look at anything now, there are strap lines everywhere. Um, you know, are those the really important parts of productions these days is where you put your graphics. So at those days, it was, they kind of ploughed that new field themselves. Lovely. And then Helen Wheatley's got a question for you as well. So, um, so this is in relation to your reflection that my career isn't important um, narrative that you heard in your interviewees and whether it's also specific to television and the feeling that it's the medium that it's itself that isn't worthy of history and analysis. And that might be particularly so of factual rather than drama because drama has that um, you know, critical worth whereas a lot of factual programme is, is so little um, commented on by, by academics generally. Yeah, I think I think it, I think certainly the formats that those people worked on. I think they don't feel that they're particularly valued by um, the wider public. Particularly, maybe you know that you enjoy them in the moment, but they come and go. There's that sort of ephemeral nature to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't tend to get box sets of old episodes of the Travel Show or something like that. But but you know, at the time they're getting massive figures, um, and they and they are important programs. You know. That department still makes Dragon's Den, and it's still getting really, you know, it's just moved to BBC One. Um, but it's it's um, factual entertainment, and it's not really something I don't think that sort of in the press or maybe in academia is felt to be particularly important or, or worthy of note. What was interesting was, and I, it chimed with me because I think when I left the BBC, one of the hardest things was throwing away my old notebooks, um, that they all said, I've still got a box in the corner. And it's got things in from my career. These are the people who'd left the industry. Um, I, I can't bring myself to throw them away, but I don't know what value, you know, what use is there in there in my old notebooks and so on. Um, so there's kind of that, it felt like there's that hint of, yes, there's a value to this, but I don't know where it is. Yeah, lovely, yeah. Um, and then a final question, because we've run out of time from, from Hannah, asking whether you could say something about the practice of interviewing people who you know personally, particularly in terms of analysing the material. Um, and, you know, there's a shared knowledge in that shorthand. And so how do you step away from that and have that researcher objectivity that enables you to, to analyse the, the, the data that you get out of the interview? I think the ad the advantage with, with the shorthand side of it is that they don't need to spend time contextualising stuff for me. Um, if they talk about people, they don't need to say, oh, because what he did was this and this is where he fitted into the hierarchy or whatever. Um, so that was a real help. I think actually knowing them and knowing their careers as well is a, it gives me that chance to sort of analyse it a bit more because I'm not necessarily just going to get the sort of the well, I am going to get their autobiographical version, but I, I know some of the other things that went on around the edges as well, um, and them and them as people and their personalities and some interpret some of those things and maybe not just take something as read that I'm told, um, but maybe question you know I'd, I'd know to kind of push on that question a little bit more than just go all oh, right okay so that was all fine we'll move on. Lovely, thank you. Um, so that brings us to, to the end of this session. So I'll hand back to Hannah. I think it's been a really interesting session. Thanks very much to, to all the speakers and to Elka for, for making it so enjoyable. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Vanessa. So it's my job now to provide a bit of a summary of the day, a bit of a close of the day. And um, if we were face to face now, if we were all together in the same room, most of us would probably be itching to get to the wine reception. And so in that spirit, I'm going to keep it quite brief. Um, so today, these are the things that have come up for me uh, that have come out of our various and fascinating work on the history of women at the BBC. Um, first of all, the, the idea that these are somehow hidden histories, that it is our job as researchers, as historians, as um, writers and thinkers about television to uncover, really came up very strongly. The idea of the kind of dynamic and paradox between visibility and invisibility seem to inflect all our papers today in various different ways, whether that is um, people whose um, roles at the BBC because they are below the line or not seen as kind of the creative or the elite um, professions um, have been rendered invisible and the work that we can do to bring those into the light and I'm really hoping that our special edition or our special issue of critical studies in television in 2022 will enable us to to shed some light on these hidden histories but there are also narratives that are coming through very strongly of the ideas of inclusion and exclusion um, of women's role being um, either a kind of supportive peer network in, in uh, the case of um, Kristen and Mark's um, cluster of women in the north or more troublingly in the, in the history of women at the BBC the lack of peer support the lack of um, um, bringing people with you in the case of people like um, Grace Wind and Goldie. Um, the thing that has come through loud and clear and that has been impossible for us to ignore today is the intersection between the gender and the class of the women that we have explored working at the BBC. Class has come up time and time again as an important factor in whether the work of women, the contribution of women um, and the reputation of women has uh, been visible or invisible in the past. And it seems to me that we need to be doing a lot more uncovering of that intersectional history. And of course, there are histories that are even more invisible because we haven't had space to talk about them today. Intersections with other identities, um, as Kristen mentioned, BAME, LGBTQ+. The other thing to say about visibility and invisibility, and one of the things that we've been trying to work around today about doing television history, is the visibility or invisibility of what is and isn't in the archive, um, or our ability to read the archive, because as Kate and Emma and many of our participants um, reveal to us, there are ways of reading the archive that come from a place of knowledge um, because there is a certain amount of decoding that needs to go on that can render certain aspects of history invisible. And then of course there's what's not in the archive at all or as, as Kevin was telling us quite heartbreakingly, archives that were and then disappeared. Um, so uh, that's kind of my summary of the day and um, what I'm really hoping for is that when it comes to publishing some of this wonderful work in progress in critical studies and television we're going to be revealing much more of this rich history of women working at the BBC. Um, and with that I just want to say a huge thanks to all our presenters, um, all our, to our chairs and to our respondents for making this such a fascinating day and then thank you all so very much for coming and for staying with us and that's it. Thank you very much.